OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, very welcome along. It's Monday morning. It's Jerry Gilroy and Johnny Ward with you all the way through until 10 this morning. Johnny, how are you? Good morning, Jer. You had a big, big Saturday night out at the dogs. Saturday night at the dogs. Doing my bit of uh, freelance journalism at the dogs. Got a little opportunity to work there and Virgin Media for the semi final and the final. I see there was uh, some criticism on social media about a virgin showing the, the greyhound racing which used to be um obviously shown on the uh, terrestrial channel um but uh, it was a great night yeah i hadn't been hadn't been at the dogs in a while actually um was it busy it was it was busy yeah like the the, the derby final is the the biggest night by a stretch um but there was a good buzz in the place i don't think it was quite as busy maybe as previous years um a lot of it was an interesting aspect of it was a lot of the these the dogs that are rehomed by uh after their careers were kind of on display, which was a very nice touch. Um, so it's something in, in horse racing, I think, you see in the States where horses in America, they're led to post by retired racehorses and they give kind of roles to these retired racehorses and something that um, we could possibly replicate over here, but um, that's obviously a big a big thing that the Greyhound board over here is trying to promote because apparently Greyhounds make amazing pets. They don't actually want to run around at all. They just want to sit in the couch and be nice to you. Right, and let's face it, the entire sport is clinging to its very existence after what happened on prime time a couple of years ago yeah so the I, I i think that's i mean speaking to people on saturday night i think that really needs to be promoted if i were running uh, that aspect of the greyhound industry i would basically be setting up like apps and websites with availabilities of all the dogs that are available to rehome to be rehomed to, uh, you know give pictures of them, videos of them, talk about their characters because uh, there obviously has to be a life after greyhound racing and um, I think greyhound racing and horse racing both have, um, they definitely have challenges going forward. I think, you know, in in, in Britain, I don't think there's a greyhound racing track in London anymore. Harris Cross, um, site where I live, has been lost in Dublin um, and on the racing front, um, field sizes and horse racing, field sizes in Britain are really falling off a cliff. Um, so there are problems ahead and animal rights groups have, have issues obviously with both sports so um, interesting times ahead Alright, it's uh, 7.33 this morning we're going to get into the big stories of the weekend um, if you're just waking up and you're a San Francisco 49ers fan then you should go back to bed because uh, Trey Lance broke his ankle after the third play yesterday we might talk about that a little bit later on What about the Jets? We probably, what about the Jets? You, Unbelievable Even you Onsi saw this Onside kick uh, uh, you, you, And you never see a successful onside kick it's like this thing that happens, you know, which you need to use three or four times a season, they're so shit at it in, in American football. They just can't kick the ball 10 yards and not make it um, completely rubbish. And, uh, yeah, it was incredible. Absolutely incredible. And they weren't the only incredible comeback. The Miami Dolphins are, like, one of the most exciting teams in any sport ever. You were watching after. the Red Zone? I was watching the Red Zone for an hour, and then I went to bed. I was like, it's gonna, can't, can't take this anymore. <laughs> it's uh, some of my WhatsApp groups last night. This is the greatest, like sporting experience around at the moment the red zone the nfl if you haven't tried it even if you're not into the nfl it's just it's it encapsulates throwing 50 games together at its best and feeling like you're not really missing much i think yesterday was one of the all-time great because <laughs> there was two absolutely ridiculous comebacks mm. where the baltimore ravens were absolutely sensational against miami and it looked like it was going to be a blowout and then all of a sudden from the depths of hell miami started pulling things together and then the jets who uh, don't even have their first choice quarterback but who have a quarterback who always beats the Browns, mm. and the Browns were hammering them with their backup quarterback. With like, what, a minute and a half to go or something like that? Two touchdowns after the two-minute warning, <laughs> which almost never happens. You're supposed to be able to play at the two-minute warning if you're a reasonable team and just sit on the ball. But they were unable to do it. So anyway, that's some of the stuff that you might have missed. If you want to talk to us about that, we'd love to hear from you. 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Our performance rankings are coming up now. We're going to talk to Kathleen about the weekend's uh, WSL fixtures. Massive defeats for uh, some of the favourites. A, a good Villa win. Two Villa wins over the weekend. Uh, unexpected one and, I don't know. Uh, ben Jacobs is going to talk to us about the situation at Leicester where it looks and feels a lot like Brendan Rodgers is on his way out after another hammering yesterday, bringing the sports pages. Talk to Kyle around 8.35. Martin Lippman's going to join us at 8.50 for more football. Alan Quinlan's going to join us to look back on the first weekend of the URC. And uh, we'll bring you some of the Sunday paper review as well. But at 7.35, it is time for this week's edition of the Gillette Performance Rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is just 
lack that intensity. So over Sunday evening, you can uh, head over to our Instagram and put stuff in the box that you think is uh, going to be in the green, in the red, or in the amber. Uh, Bobby Dwyer is a little bit late. He's only coming to us now. If Hyunming Sun isn't in the green, there will be riots in North London. Is he, yeah. he going to be in the green? Not, actually. Um, oh, I didn't even, didn't even think about it. Yeah, we spoke about his, uh, you know... his. his He's reports, back. Yeah, reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated type thing on Saturday. We spoke about it with JD, obviously our resident Spurs fan, and... Uh, his, his well, uh, yeah, Bobby Dwyer likes to think he's our resident Spurs fan. <laughs> his, uh, his stats have kind of fallen off a cliff this Cause we, year. Because we made him our resident Spurs fan. But anyway, go on. Um, his, his stats have obviously fallen off. His dribbles and his... I think he is one of these players. He plays with a smile on his face. And his smile had kind of rather gone. But it's back, as were the goals. He even got a controversial sort of... Um, did not he do his national service or did he get away with not doing it? Not sure about that. At least he's not living in the north of the... Old country, he, did, he did it, Colin says. Colin says he thinks he did it. Even his National Service couldn't take a smile off his face. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how bad it was for him, you know. Was it like basically lying on the couch watching people do work? Why Look, I'm a footballer, now I can do here. It's not my fault. Yeah. He's, the smile is back, if not for Brendan Rodgers. Uh, no, the smile is not back for Brendan Rodgers. Is he in the red? So the way this works is people are in the red, the amber and the green. And then you tell us, Johnny, who's in the amber, who's in the red, who's in the green. We'll start with the red, though. Who's in the red? Yeah, Brendan Rodgers, the, you know, he just doesn't seem to be able to stem the flow of, of the, the goals that Leicester are conceding. And um, I think uh, I, I'd be on the favourable side of looking at Brendan Rodgers as a manager. I think in general, um, he's, he's, his teams play very good football. I think at Liverpool, um, he was part of that bridge between, you know, winning the league eventually and that failure for so long I think he, he was a little bit unlucky and um, he, he, he signed some very good players as well at Leicester though he just can't seem to stem the flow of goals they're conceding and you know they were actually good in the first half on Saturday evening they, they play nice football James Madison says after the game you know it's on the players usually when you hear that the manager's going to go soon and it doesn't look good no it doesn't look good it does that. No. the only thing is that he's got a big contract and they have to pay a lot of money to get rid of him mm. but they have to make the decision is he still is he still the right man for the job at the moment or has has we, we've talked about how well he's handled the scenario he hasn't come out and said that the club has been mishandled over the last period of time and there will be some transfer money you would expect that they'll be able to spend at Christmas <clears throat> so I, I don't know the, 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 the thing about Rodgers, like we've spoken about managers this year, that when you're involved in sports journalism and w like one result sort of changes everything and you're like, oh, what did I say on Saturday? Now, now everything is rosy again, like Villa and to an extent Everton or whatever. So we've gone through managers who looked under pressure and, um, you know, Scott Parker was the first to go and probably wasn't expecting Chelsea to make the change they did. The one thing about Rodgers is that I don't know what Leicester's ambition is this season. They obviously don't want to get relegated, but they shouldn't get relegated. So maybe they'll be happy to give him a bit of time. And he, d he does make good signings. And I haven't seen Leicester this season. So maybe, maybe it's a fact that they, they'll be OK once they sort out their defensive problems. And I, I generally, do, I think sacking managers is generally a waste of time. Like if you, you appoint the manager, you should have belief in him or her to do the job and then give him or her the time and don't make snap decisions. We'll see what happens, but um, obviously he's he's under pressure. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Dumpy's column in the Star today, has he's got no... Um, he's still only 49, but it's up to Rogers to prove that he's not yesterday's man. He says that um, he talks about death by passing. Do you remember that? That was mm. a thing? And he was like, he went on and on and on and on and on and on about death by passing. Um, but, sorry, death by football. One of the reasons Liverpool finished seventh in Rodgers' first season in charge was down to that philosophy. So Liverpool did finish seventh in Brendan Rodgers' first season in charge of Liverpool. They did better than that afterwards, though. Mm. They did improve. Should have won the league. They should have won the league, yeah. Mm. Passing for passing's sake, possession football with little end product. There have been tweaks since, but it's often still the Rodgers' way and there's a feeling that the game might be passing him by. Is there? Did he not drag Leicester to like no. the verge of qualification for the Champions League? Is he not still a really good manager that's just gone pear-shaped? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think the game is passing by, and I think <coughs> Brendan Rodgers would be a bit of a, he, he would be a bit of an innovator in terms of keeping up with the trends. I think he's, he's, he's a good eye for a player as well. Um, I don't know if he's the eye for the player. I'm always a little bit wary about that because there's like a director of football, a scouting director. Do you know he's been able to integrate the players they've signed really well? I would say. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Like, <coughs> it, it, it's. 
the relationship with the board is obviously going to be key. Um, but it would be it'd be a big blow for him. Um, you know, even at forty nine, it would be a big blow. I, I think he's savvy enough to get a good job. Still, well, that's it. So where where would you reckon he will get a job next? Mm, that I really don't know. Give me a, the range of clubs. Well, who's <laughs> I would have probably expected. I mean, the likes of Everton and Villa, are they going to be there indefinitely? Probably. Probably a Premier League club, but not a top club. So, a uh, West Ham? Maybe a West Ham, yeah. Moisey under pressure. Moisey is under pressure. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, Moisey's not... No, there's no pressure. And it's like, hang on a second now. Two more results. And they're like, well, we've got this amazing stadium and we need to keep Declan Rice. Mm. Or they decide they make Moyes sell Declan Rice in the summer. He takes the blame next summer. And then the owners hire a new manager. That might be why they're they're thinking about that. I don't know, but some like uh, would he have been in the running for the Spurs gig before Conte got it? He probably would. He would have been in the running for the Chelsea job if the Chelsea job had come up six months ago. If the Chelsea job had come up in the summer, Brendan Rodgers would have been one of the favourites for it. I would say. Yeah, I'm not sure about that now, though. I think I don't Chelsea know connection. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that the not sure his stock is that high at this stage for jobs as big as that. I'd say it was at the end of last year. Mm. Like everybody was blaming the injuries they had last season on last season's performance not being very good, and I think that was fair enough because they had uh, the, the squad was ripped apart. Now everybody's fit largely, and uh, things aren't going well. But it does look like his time there is coming to an end. He hasn't been sacked yet. We're we're still waiting to see if they're going to do it. If they do it, it'll probably be today, or it won't be this side of the um, international break. Um, okay, so that's in the red. Brendan Rodgers, Leicester in big trouble. League of Ireland, big boys. Yeah, the FAI Cup definitely matters. Um, you're saying you're saying shells aren't a big boy. Is that what? It, Derry not a Derry not a big boy, no. Well, they they um, it's just convenient that we've managed to fit the League of Ireland slot into this one because the three big teams who all have been you know big players in the League of Ireland in recent years, Shamrock Rovers, Bohemians, and Dundalk, all out of the cup, starting with Shamrock Rovers. Um, yesterday, I would give them a bit of a pass on because um, Derry like. Derry were hot favourites to win the game, which is very rare, um, against Sharma Rovers, and Derry were outstanding. Like, Why were they favourites? Because they, what have they, five games on the bounce without conceding, winning going into the game, five wins on the bounce without conceding going into the game. They have a midfield five now um, that to me looks as good as you've seen in the League of Ireland. It's Patrick McElhenney, who was outstanding yesterday, has been main captain. Will Patching, fantastic footballer. Diallo, who they got from Man City, who I hadn't seen, and I'm like, ex-Man City, kind of a exotic name. He's going to be really flashy, but he's more like a Torre type player. He's, he's like, this is the first time I saw him play, and it was on TV, so I'm, maybe I'm making a snap judgment. He looks like this kind of unique midfielder who's just strong and like can con- kind of like control aspects of a game that we don't have in the League of Ireland. Cameron Dummigan, I know Rory Higgins thinks he's up there in terms of the players of the season, full stop, and he probably is out- outstanding again yesterday. Rob Jack Byrne, um, blind at one time the first half, Jack had a frustrating day, and then you add in Michael Duffy. Jamie McGonigal, um, who'd been on a terrible run of, of form uh, goals-wise, gets the goal. And then Rovers are down to 10 men. I thought it was a harsh red card. Will Patching, penalty to win the game. Um, hits the bar. Rovers come back, showed a great attitude. Really, really against the odds. Four sex time, but they were, they were tired. Rovers, I wouldn't give them so much of a pass on the, uh, again, performance last week. I think they're giving up terrible goals in Europe. And they really have to stem the, t- stem the, the flow of that there because they're better than that. And they're giving themselves no chance with the goals they're giving away. That's Rovers. Bows were pathetic against uh, Shelburne yesterday. Their season is done um, in the middle of September. They're miles out of it uh, in the race for Europe. Pete Long obviously left two weeks ago. There was an initial um, reaction when they beat Shamrock Rovers, but um, they haven't really followed that up. And if you read Aidan Fitzmaurice, who obviously would have a soft spot for Bowes in the independent, he doesn't mince his words. Um, so they're done. Embarrassing was how their Derek Pender described them. Yeah, and I think Jordan Flores apologising to fans. They made a... Quadruple sub at half times. At half times. Sounds like something you'd be ordering at lunch. Like they made a quadruple sub and it made no difference. Um, which I'm, I'm not sure I've seen that before at half time. Maybe I have. But anyway, um, so the atmosphere going. at Talca Park, I, the, the Griffith Avenue Mile was on yesterday. So mm. there was like two and a half thousand people on the streets, um, you know, 1,500 running it and another thousand supporting people. 
and the atmosphere was absolutely sensational. That was yesterday afternoon around about three o'clock. And then after it was over, uh, you could hear this crazy noise coming. I was like, what's going on? It's like, ah, oh, it's a cup. Because yeah. obviously, talk is never really used on a Sunday. So... Where, where's the noise coming from? It sounded like Croke Park noise. It was that good, the atmosphere. Yeah, the, and Tol- Tolka, like, I used to live off to Tolka when I was in college and like it's it hasn't changed all that much um, but it's a really atmospheric ground and um, there but for the grace of God it would have been gone and you know turned into housing. We need houses but I think we need um, Tolka Park going forward as well and that's it's. I'm glad that's saved. It's a really, really atmospheric ground and Rovers, um, obviously, and Bowes uh, out of the cup. Dundalk out of the cup as well, Ger. Coughing up, a bit bit like Brendan Rodgers and Leicester at the minute, just coughing up so many goals. And um, they, they'd started the season quite well. They went on this great run of form where they looked like they were in the title race for one moment. And then they've just started... I was just thinking of this. They lost Connolly, who they'd signed, the, the Monaghan boy. They'd signed him. They lost him. Derry signed him. And I, I was thinking of this when I was in bed last night. Do your stats in the morning. What's Dundalk's um, record since Connolly left? And what's Derry's record since he joined Derry? Unfortunately, I completely forgot about that until now. There you go. It's safe to say he's made a big difference to both. Dundalk's defence, you know, has... You're more an eye test man anyway, rather than a stats man. Isn't that right, Johnny? You're you're all about the feel. How does he make you feel watching him play? You feel good. How does it... Yeah... It is, it is a bit about feel. I should have done my research. I, I just forgot. I don't know what came over me. I started reading about climate change or something. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so uh, that's You're, you're mourning the passing of Her Majesty. Well, I mean, she's not, she was 96. Like Honestly, it's not really a big news story. 96-year-old woman dies. World is about to end because of fossil fuels. But, nah, 96-year-old woman. I find, it, I find it astonishing. I don't know what you think. Like, get over it at this age. Um, I have I have found the stories about the queue and the, the various businesses and people. Nobody um, see the DUP um, skip the queue because you know they are MLAs doing absolutely nothing, and um, it's great to see their their loyalty. Yeah, and and Holly and your man as well. They also skipped the queue, but David Beckham didn't. We, we'll hear from the pay per view. Um, I think uh, it was Dion who, who nailed it yesterday, talking about Beckham and his public image, which obviously has taken an absolute battering because he's taken all that money from Qatar. Mm. And now all of a sudden his, his public image is restored. One fell swoop. All it took was 12 hours and some donuts. I'm not sure I'd queue for 12 hours to restore my public image, but I'd probably just stay in bed. <coughs> I don't know. How are we on about the League of Ireland teams? Back to... So that's the, they're, the, they're, the, they're the three teams. So Dundalk now have a challenge to get into Europe this season. They probably should be okay, but Stephen O'Donnell probably the toughest time of his career management so far, I think in terms of just results, because it's, it's a sticky patch for them. Bows have to rebuild, they've no manager at the moment, and Rovers should be fine, but they're out of the cup. It's great for Shells, it's great for Derry, we should pay testimony to those. You, you think uh, Waterford might turn Shells over in the semi, though? Uh, Waterford, uh, you know, they've, they've new ownership, um, there was nearly 4,000 at the game the other night, a really atmospheric ground as well. It's a funny one, Jared, the RSC, because there's a, a running track around it, but there's great noise in the place. Um, uh, you know, any time I've been there, that I really noticed that. Waterford, they've already knocked Patch and Dundalk out of the cup. I think they've every chance of beating Shells. The big team I want to mention here is Derry City. If you watch that game yesterday, and Eamon Sweeney talks about it, the quality of Derry's football, they will almost certainly beat Treaty, who were brilliant against UCD. They'll almost certainly beat Treaty. Derry City in Lansdowne Road is uh, an occasion and a place befitting the quality of this team and the style of football they have. Rory Higgins is going to be a really good manager. They are serious challengers to Shamrock Rovers next season, though. Michael Duffy is back. And they were by far the better team yesterday. I know Rovers had excuses. Derry City, this was a massive statement. They they won the game after extra time. They were way better than Rovers, way better, and it was a big statement. Uh, I think we should um, we should definitely. Uh, oh, there's exclusive extracts from Arthur's book in the Indo today. I didn't know that. We we'll talk about that in a minute in our pay per view. Um, we, this was the season that started with you and, and Damien Duff going toe-to-toe and Damien Duff's going to lead his team to the promised land by winning the cup at the end of the year, Johnny. You can take that to the bank. Let's move on. Toe-to-toe would be a bit of a stretch, but uh, Damien Duff's Shelburne could be in the cup final. Not a sleeping giant. not be banking on them. Not a sleeping, not a sleeping giant. giant. A giant. On them. They're a giant, Johnny. You're, here you are, writing them off in the semi. They just absolutely annihilated Bowes on a Sunday Bowes. afternoon in the summer to the point where Bowes are saying they're embarrassing themselves and you're like, yeah, what if we're going to beat them in the semis? He's you need to, you need to get over that. You need to let bygones be bygones. Let the sleeping dogs lie. The giant is woken. It's a yeah. You know. Duffer is box office, and as a Bose fan, um, you know you're, you're, there was 
terrible queues getting into the ground. They didn't delay the kickoff, and then they were probably told to wait behind afterwards for security reasons. Watched an abject 4 0 defeat. The season's over. Hopefully, they had a good Sunday night afterwards because not a good Monday morning for them. Uh, right, URC. A mixed return for the provinces is what it says on the subheading here. Yeah, Munster, um, Munster s- s- still seem to have questions uh, against them very much. Leinster obviously almost had one of the greatest collapses uh, in, probably in, in the history of the competition uh, against Zebra, um, who had a load of new players, obviously got over the line. Ulster, good against Connacht. We'll talk about this obviously with Quinny later, but... Um, yeah, the Leinster one is interesting because is, is there a bit of a hangover from uh, last season defensively? Um, obviously, very early days. That's the thing. It's it's too early to say anything about anything here. Like Munster fans might be thinking, "Oh, that's not a great start," but like, let's wait and see until um, the best team or the best available players or if there's any time going. Uh, as I said, more on this with Alan Quinn a little bit later on. So let's move on to the green. We have Irish centre halves and. We're bearing the lead, obviously, in much the same way that uh, Desi Farrell did. Which one of these you want to do first? Of the Dublin football or the Irish CBs? I mean, does, Irish centre half. Does Nathan Collins get a, in the green for nearly decapitating one-time Ireland star well, Jack Grealish? Well, I saw a lot of Ireland fans kind of ha 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 ha. But actually, uh, Nathan Collins waited around for forty minutes after ki- after full time to apologise. Nathan Collins is just to Jack Grealish. He's just a top, 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 top lad. And uh, I watched the game up until that point. Um, then I was like, switch over to Swansea to watch Ryan Manning. Um, kind of didn't, but Ryan Manning scored in that time. He's not in the Ireland squad, obviously. So we'll talk about the Ireland back five. But Nathan Collins was like, he was. I'm marking Alfie. I'm marking Erling Haaland today. Alfie Inga Haaland. I'm marking Erling Haaland. So I like. First ball into the box after, what, 50 seconds or whatever it is. I'll mark. But unfortunately, Grealish steals in. Then Haaland scores. He had nothing, there was nothing he could do about that. Game's over. Then he was sent off. But I, I actually think it was one of them things that looked worse the more you looked at it. It was more like it, it happened very fast. His legs were high. Fair enough. Grealish didn't make an absolute meal of it either. And the, ball there, the, hmm? the ball was there, I think. The ball was there, I think. There. Um, the boy Mort on Twitter, on Twitter, people have found, he's, he's turned the... The attack into like a postage stamp, um, which I thought was hilarious and got a lot of traction. I think a lot of Irish people are still a little bit annoyed at Grealish. Let's just hope Collins behaves when he goes to West Ham. <coughs> you think that's where he's gone next? When he plays against West Ham. Why? Yeah. Well, against, oh, yeah. right. Against maybe Declan maybe he just was exercising the frustration of players who once played for Ireland. But yeah. No, I think in general he's had a very good start season. He seemed very sorry afterwards. He did. He's a top lad. The other two centre backs, obviously, that we want to mention, Omar Bamadeli and Darrow O'Shea, were in action against each other. Darrow O'Shea scored, by all accounts, very bad defending. Omar Bamadeli's having an outstanding start to the season. I want to say, Stephen Kenny, this is my three. Forevermore, these are the three pick, you go. Pick with. them now, right, right now. It's a, absolutely. Let's go. So John Egan's out of the team. Yeah, I'd go with this three. Um, Duffy's out of the team. Duffy, Duffy's not playing at the moment either. Which I think, when when the margins are like Duffy for me, I, I think he'd be lucky to play anyway. He's a liability on the ball. Um, the other three aren't. And like, I, did you watch the game on the, the the Man City Wolves game at all? I saw bits of it. Collins, like, fair enough. I mean, it, it was relevant in the overall scheme of things. But he did this amazing little run outside his own box early on take on a couple of players and he's so comfortable on the ball and the other two lads you have to remember they're centre backs but they have to offer us something on the ball and going forward as Collins and memorably did against Ukraine these are my three going forward right now pick the, the team now. pick the team for the Scotland game then so those three who are your left and right back left wing back will be um, I think it's going to be Robbie Brady OK. Um, and obviously, like... Right wing back? I think, by the way, Nate, Ryan Manning's a bit unlucky. He's playing well. He's not the squad. Um, interesting going forward, what they'll do. Right, right wing back will be... Um, will be Doherty. Uh, so no Coleman in the team? No, no. Coleman can't play right wing back anymore. He just doesn't have the legs. I think if Coleman's to play for Ireland, it'll be right at the three centre-backs. But he's down the, he's down the list for me in that anyway, I think. Mm-hmm. And again, it's the, club, it's the club issue. He's not going to get a look in. At, Everton have a very good young right back. Yeah, Doherty's not playing either though at the moment. He's so. not, but he's, he's, he's still, it doesn't seem to have affected him as much either like last, last year. Um, they're I, after the, the I think he's going to pick Coleman. Just, it's just purely on instinct, I think he's oh, going to pick can't. Coleman. Well, if you I have the three 21 year olds, if you have three 21 year old centre backs, who's going to be the leader on the pitch? I'm not saying he'll necessarily go with that three. He might play Egan. Like, he, might, he really likes Egan. They would be my three. 
Um, but so which of the three do you think he drops? Um, Van Dijk is probably the easiest one, is he? <laughs> well, he's, he's club form. He's, his club form is so good. I don't know, but I'd, I'd say he'd, he'd, he might he might play Egan and two and and obviously Collins, who's like basically along with Cullen is the starter now straight away, and obviously um, it's a tough one for him. I, I I just I love the youth of that team. Yeah. Coleman, though, I, I don't really see him playing wing back. Uh, he just doesn't have the legs for it. I think he might pick him. I'm thinking he might pick him there, and he, I think he's going to pick Doherty at left wing back and leave Robbie Brady on the bench so that mm. Brady can kind of cover in in a lot of different places. That's my that's my team at the moment that I think he will pick. And actually, I think he will go with the three under twenty ones because or the three young lads because that you think he will? I, I do. I think that's the type of thing that will. Um, you know, you can point to this is my team for the future, and look what look what we're doing here. Like, and also, like the Nations League is very important, but it's also not the be all and end all. You know, the other thing is if you've Robbie Brady and Doherty as your f- wing backs, these are seriously good footballers. Like, they're not even like defending is kind of part of their artillery now. But we we we'll, we'll play a lot of nice football in midfield. Then Cullen, this is a tough one. Maybe nice. I see. Uh, is he going to pick Jason Knight from, from League One? Yeah, I mean, he, he, his right performance back. for Ireland has um, been sensational. Uh, maybe he plays him in the right wing, a uh, right wing back. Uh, that's a, that could be a get him in the team. That's actually not a. That's not a crazy call. That's not a crazy call. Um, then obviously Brown up front. I don't know. That's that's. It's just become very muddled now with the Open family. I did. I, I did find it strange that Stephen Kenny, who's such a mild mannered guy could have managed to wind up both Jurgen Klopp and uh, Russell Martin, which is just... Because he, he, he does... He says things for... He does say things generally for a reason in that he thinks about it beforehand. And what he said about Obafemi, about two or three sides to a story, I was kind of like, uh, whatever, yeah, that's fair enough. He's defending the player. But then Russell Martin's like, well, no, that's, there, there aren't. Which, obviously, there are. But, like, why did he say it? What did, what did Martin say? Sorry, just like, like, well, fill, they're, they're, fill people in on this. So... Obafemi wanted, seemingly wanted out of Swansea. You know, there wasn't, where was he going? Was it Bur- Burnley. Burnley. So there was, last minute looks like he's gone. He doesn't go. He was then dropped by Russell Martin. And bear in mind, Obafemi's own career was sort of, where, we'll see how this loan move goes at Swansea last year. And he absolutely thrived under Russell Martin. And he carried that form into Ireland. So he obviously was getting on. Russell Martin's a real like football manager, like loves the style of play. Obafemi was then dropped. He's like, we can't play him until he kind of gets his head right. Was brought on at the end of the, was it the 3-0 win on, on Saturday? Was brought on at the end, so maybe that's the proverbial olive, proverbial olive branch. But Stephen Kenny in his press conference said, there are two or three sides to the story why Obafemi isn't playing. For me, that's, I'm going to defend my player here. Yeah. Obafemi has, he has his own version. He obviously wanted to leave. And I and think they wanted to sell him. Evaluation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, but Russell Martin um, wasn't happy with that. Interestingly, seemed to compare, um, I may be paraphrasing here, but seemed to compare the attitude of Obafemi somewhat to Ryan Manning, the Galwegian, who I, I still reiterate isn't in the Ireland squad, which I think is a little bit unfortunate. The left back situation is is a bit mad now, because okay. I think Enda Stevens is under serious pressure there. Yeah, no, for sure. All right, oh, well, oh, and again, I don't know who starts uh, up front, Obafemi and. Parrot, maybe who, the non-goal scoring, but playing well <laughs> centre forward. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. Well, certainly they've done well for Ireland. So recently, so maybe that's what uh, managers remember. In the green this morning, which something which may have a, a, a long-term impact on the power rankings. Dublin football. What happened yesterday? Yeah, I don't want to turn like everything. Like when you when you're involved in in the betting game, you, you know odds like and sport are always in your head. But Dublin were eleven to four to win the All Ireland yesterday. They were second favourites. Dublin are clearly favourites to win the All Ireland now, right? No, they are. No, 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 they no. They nearly no, be, no, they no. lost to Kerry by a point without these two players. Yeah, yeah, without yeah. Without even necessarily playing that well. Yeah, but a Kerry team had never won an All Ireland. Yeah, but now they, the Kerry team have won an All Ireland. They have. They have. But Dublin, like, there's nothing sates your appetite more at this level than like being written off to an extent, and and that. Sense of you know defeat. So you said they, they were eleven to four. They were eleven. To, I don't think that'll last. They're I mean, two to one now. You're right. So maybe the bookmaker had reacted to the news, but like obviously they get through Leinster. Um, I I didn't I didn't really rate Dublin this this year thinking that I thought Kerry beat them comfortably. They 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 somehow managed to hold on, and the two lads coming back and Conor McKeown writes about it in the Irish Independent. It was kind of like Desi Farrell was on Dubs TV, which I didn't know existed. He's like, oh yeah, the two lads are the two lads will be back as well, so that'll be good. And uh, there we are. Dublin will win the All Ireland next year. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when uh, somebody in the Munster camp 
was uh, jaw jawing with somebody in the Leinster camp about, ah, we'll see how good you are now, Rocky Elson's gone. And then Leinster went out and smashed them the next year because the, you know, the galvanising taunt of like, Oh, we'll see now. We've got our lads back, which is what Kerry you're going to be listening to all year. It's like, oh, you only won that because Con wasn't in the game. And now it's going to be, oh, you're not going to be so good now that it's going to have Con and they're going to have Mannion and they're going to have McCaffrey. McCaffrey. Uh, McCaffrey, who's the guts of four years out. Like, I didn't realise this um, in terms of his time play, his player for Dublin. He's 29 now, but uh, how sensational is this All Ireland going to be at the latter It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I'm not saying it's not going to be good, but I do think that a carrier though, looking so. at this, like, uh, thinking, all right, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, bring it. Fine. Like, you think Kerry are going to take a backward step? You think Kerry aren't going to be like 20 to 35% better next season by virtue of the fact that they're now a team full of confidence who, who got that monkey off their back? Like, I think this is actually good news for Kerry. It, it sharpens the resolve over the winter. It's not good news for Kerry. I mean, it, that's, there's the, no, that's a crazy comment. And it's not. You it's can't not. say, oh, Paul Mannion come back to Dublin is Absolutely. not good news for Kerry. It that's, sharpens them. That's crazy it means there's no, there's no extra drinking over the winter. The training, the training starts earlier. <laughs> Jack O'Connor and whoever else is in that backroom team last night were electrified by the news that the lads are back. They were like, "Right, we're we're getting thinking on this. We're gonna have we're gonna have scouts at the Dublin Club Championship games. We're gonna be watching this. See how the we're, we're sending out the training the regime now. The preseason, the end of it. It's all it's all moving forward a couple of weeks. Crazy talk. No, um, this, is, this is perfect. The one aspect of Dublin, though, some of their marquee players weren't weren't the players they were probably last year and that's nothing to do with the two lads so you know they didn't really look the Dublin team they were but no. Mannion being back and McCaffrey um, it's, it's it's also good for Dublin don't, don't get me wrong here it's also I good for Dublin I think it's good for Dublin that's two of uh, the best players we've seen are back in the team Yeah, and it's massive for Desi Farrell I mean we haven't heard much from him since the Kerry game um, but Desi must be smiling into his proverbial... We haven't heard anything from him since no. the Kerry game. That um, was his, his he, first... He's uh, delighted with life. Dublin win the All-Ireland next year. Possibly beating Galway in the final. Uh, OK, that's your prediction. Mine is that it's going to be... A, a, It'll probably be Dublin Kerry final. Yeah. I, and uh, Wouldn't that be good? Don't we deserve some nice things in our lives? We do. Hopefully it'll be in August as opposed to in uh, July. Uh, right, that is this week's episode of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. We're going to well, yeah, we're going to be joined next by uh, Cathy McNamee to talk about the first weekend of the WSL. First, though, as I was talking about a little bit earlier on in the Sunday paper review, uh, they were talking about David Beckham's already infamous queuing. David Beckham gave me such a boost this week. You know when you see a master at their craft, <laughs> <laughs> like it's one of those ideas. Like it's just one of those things that people will be looking at it. It's like one of those great kind of uh, inventions. People will be like, why didn't we think of that? Every celebrity, every celebrity in Britain, their thought on Thursday and Friday would be, how do we skip the queue? <laughs> yeah. How do we skip the queue? And David Beckham, who we will go on, we might talk about guitar in a bit, and like if you, if you Google David Beckham, you'll see the, the criticism he was getting for his, his videos in support of guitar and all that kind of stuff. Hasn't got his knighthood, all these things that he was dreaming of. Beckham just flipped that on his head. Or somebody working for Beckham flipped it on his head and saying, you don't need to skip the queue, David. You need to join that queue. And it was just, I just looked at it and went, that is, that is just a master of his craft. Do you know what's quite interesting is, um, I, like it's 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 a, a weakness of mine, but I do uh, enjoy a, a, a ten minute trip to the Daily Mail showbiz section and the comment section reveal much about like the world that we're living in, you know. And Beckham has not been popular on there for quite a long time now. They really don't like him. And a, a bit like you, I thought, well, this is a fair. This is a, no, a stunt is harsh, and I think he's he's, he's well meaning in some respects, but he could have skipped the queue, and maybe he knew that he would garner some attention by not. And I thought, well transparent enough uh, thing to do but honestly the Daily Mail readers swept away in this kind of week of weeks like, yeah, there's lots of everyone swept away but it's like, not just Daily I'm telling you in everyone, Britain and Ireland it's, are... it's, they're full of like look I'm no fan of Beckham <laughs> but I tell you what he queued up and, but also not only did he they're not saying they're no fan of Beckham but now, and now they're saying he queued up he's now just put into sharp relief all the people who didn't queue well, up sorry Holly Willoughby and oh, Philip Schofield yeah, to that, say, you know, we were, we were there the, in a working yeah. capacity we didn't skip the queue <laughs> like this is the well, when, you, when you have 10 days of a news cycle yeah. 
it's yeah. too like it's too long for the modern world. Like, yeah, there's more of that paper discussion coming your way around about half past nine this morning. Cathy McNamee is with us to talk to us about a fairly uh, tumultuous opening weekend of the WSL, which obviously, again, had been all cancelled last week because of um, the the funeral celebrations. They played for her. They played for her this weekend. It was for her. <laughs> Where do you want to start? I think you have to start with Liverpool, Chelsea. Um, Liverpool, obviously, newly promoted. Lots of Irish talent in there. We have Campbell, Kiernan and Fahey all played. And they beat Chelsea, who are looking to go for four in a row in league titles. It's, it's actually it's kind of unusual because it's actually, I think, in the last five seasons, Chelsea have been beaten on the opening day all bar one and have still managed to win the league three times out of that. So not maybe all that unsurprising. A lot of the time they do suffer on that first day because so many of their players are involved in big internationals before they head into the new season. They didn't have that excuse this time, did they? Mm, not as much they would have with the Euros and with World Cup qualifiers. A lot of their players would have come into camp a bit later than the others. Um, but Emma Hayes said it herself after the match. She was like, it's not that Liverpool were taking loads of shots all the time. And actually, if anyone was doing it for them, it was Leanne Kiernan, who unfortunately went off injured and it looked quite bad, which is maybe a slight worry for Vera Powell coming up to the World Cup playoff, um, although she doesn't play Kiernan all that often. But she looked like a bright spark. Um, it was just more that... Liverpool got very, very lucky when it came to the penalties and they took their chances when they came. Thanks to some lovely Campbell long free throws. <laughs> Love a long throw. Mm, well, it was great. Like She came on for Leanne Kiernan and she got that long throw, for which got the first penalty. Um, just put it into the box. It bounced around the box off Millie Bright's hand and there you go. Liverpool had their opening goal. How much of an outlier is that in the game? Because like, it's a... As a Galway United fan, it's one of our sort of, even in, I think, League of Ireland level now, Men's League of Ireland, it's rare. Like, you'd get the odd one, but to see Campbells are insane. Like, it must be mayhem to defend against. It's incredibly rare. Like, you just do not get them at all. I can't think of another player in the league who actually does that. In fact, I can't really think of anyone else, even in some of the other European leagues, who does that sort of free throw. It's just not something that teams are used to defending against. And it's been unfortunate that she has had the injuries for so mm. long because it has been something that Ireland and Liverpool haven't really been able to benefit off. Um, but I'm excited to see the chaos that it is going to mm. cause for the rest of the season. The only thing is that because she is known for it, teams will probably be able to prep for it a bit more now and actually see, you know, that she doesn't get as much off them, but... Yeah, it's hard to prepare for it, though. It is, it like, is, it is. You know, oh, they're going to do this thing. Yeah, I know they're going to do this thing, then pff, wow, <laughs> took my head off. Like, um, But I think it is one of, like, Liverpool's secret weapons. Obviously, it's their first season back up in the WSL. They don't have maybe a lot of the star power that a lot of the other teams are going to come up against. There are, But this is something completely unusual that, as you say, it's hard to defend against. It's hard to know what to do. And, I mean, we've seen how successful it's been for Ireland in the short time she's been back. How, so. how bad would Leanne's injury be then? And, like, how much how much is, would this have been a breakthrough season for her? As you mentioned, she's not necessarily starting for Ireland anyway. I think the season could have been massive for her, especially considering how well she was playing when she was on uh, yesterday. So she... Last season, she was like championship top scorer. She was Liverpool player of the season. She was championship player of the season. She was banging in the goals left, right and centre. And one of the reasons that she was doing so well is that she wasn't having the same sort of injury problems that she has been. It kind of looked like she had done her Achilles in or something. And she came out after um, getting some treatment in a boot and crutches and looked quite upset herself. So it didn't look all that optimistic. And it is unfortunate because I think she's exactly the sort of player that Ireland could do well with if we can make a setup where have her as the focal point and put Heather Payne on the wings along with Jessu. You know, we could actually play some really nice attacking football, which isn't necessarily what we're very well known for at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really unfortunate because I think she could have made her mark on the WSL just with that whole because she's played there before. But I think she needed that time at Liverpool and in the championship to get her confidence up after so many bad injuries. And uh, I would just feel so sorry for her if this is the end of her season so early on. Hopefully it's sore from a kick as opposed to a rupture. And um, we, we keep an eye on that over the next while. What else from um, the opening weekend stood out? Well, we also had Man City losing to Aston Villa, which is a big one. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Man City because they've lost basically their entire starting eleven, and in particular, 
a very, very good midfield. Now, they have brought in a lot of players, but there's been calls from fans for quite a few months now that Gareth Taylor, their manager, needs to go. Aston Villa had never scored against City in the league before this, so it was a pretty impressive win from them. Um, and I think it's only going to increase the amount of people calling for Gareth Taylor to leave. I mean, he was losing players like Lucy Bronze, Caroline Weir, Kira Walsh. These are some of the big, especially after the Euros, these are some of the biggest names in the game. And he can't hold on to them. Ellen White retired. There's just been a lot of chopping and changing at City, and he really needed an opening win. He got quite fortunate in the games that were postponed last weekend. They were supposed to play Arsenal. That could have been a massive scalping for them if that game had gone ahead. So quite fortunate that they didn't play them, but also very, very unlucky to get that first loss against Aston Villa. Yeah. Uh, are they blaming him for the players leaving or is it just one of those kind of Brendan Rodgers style situations where the club aren't actually investing the way they're supposed to be? There's mixed debate <clears> over <throat> it. So some of the players have come out since say someone like Georgia Stanway, who was seen as like an all round player. She literally, you wouldn't know what sort of position she would turn up on the pitch last season they had a massive injury crisis and they didn't have any goalkeepers and there was she had been prepped to turn up in goal like th this is the level <laughs> of an all-round player she is normally she plays in midfield um so there was talk that players weren't all that happy with him with his playing style that he wasn't listening to what some of the senior players were saying and then the flip side is there's also been talk saying that city aren't investing in contracts the way that other teams are so now you have say Kira Walsh and Lucy Brahms going to Barcelona for world record contracts. Those sort of players are looking for it and those teams are willing to pay for it. So yeah. City might not be keeping up in the same way that other teams have been investing. One last thing, uh, we had assumed that Courtney Brosnan was going to start the season. She did start, that's important. Very important. Um, regular playing time is so important. Uh, any regular listeners to the Koi Gig podcast will know that Emma Byrne, who's often on the show and is now joining us full time as a co-host, which is very exciting, uh, talks all the time about how important it is for starting goalkeepers at a national level to also be starting for their club team. And that hasn't been happening for Courtney Brosnan. So really glad that she is the starting keeper, it seems, for this year. Also has to be pointed out that Jessu got the assist for that West Ham goal in that game. So first start in the WSL and is already off to a flyer. So that's definitely a real positive for Ireland. All right, you talked about uh, Koi Gig there. When are you recording? What's the story? We are recording this evening our first ever show with Emma Byrne as co-host. So we'll be talking about all this in much more detail and it will be out tomorrow morning on all the usual spots where you can get your OTB podcasts. All right, Kathleen, good stuff. It's 12 minutes past eight this morning. A reminder, Brayburn Coffee is our official coffee partner here on Off The Ball. Every week coffee we give one lucky safe. viewer, a hundred euro voucher, to spend on some Brayburn Coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you to enter, check out at Off The Ball on Twitter, like and retweet our Brayburn competition post and you'll be in the draw. Brayburn Coffee never compromises on quality or taste to give you the very best on-the-go coffee experience on the road. It's available at Apple Green today. We're back after this ad break with Ben Jacobs of CBS Sports Golazzo as Brendan Rodgers appears on the brink at Leicester. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Your goalkeeping coach is your god. The transfer window is closed, but the Koi Gig Pod has made a new signing. People wanted to come to Man City, and now everyone wants to go to Barca. So why wouldn't you want to go there? Let's be honest. Friend of the pod, Emma Byrne, is joining Kathleen and Karen this season. Everyone was so buzzing. Like Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies. Used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited Trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Celebrate European Week of Sport this September at the Be Active Festival. An action-packed day out for the whole family at Sport Ireland Campus Blanchardstown. Come and try new sports, fitness challenges and skill tests at Ireland's biggest sporting festival. Meet sporting legends. Check out the Inflatable Zone, Village Food Market and much more. There's something for everyone at the Be Active Festival, Saturday, September 24th at Sport Island Campus, Blanchardstown. Book your tickets now at beactivefestival.ie. OTB AM with Gillette. 
Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, 14 minutes past eight. You're very welcome back to OTBAM. We're live each morning, brought to you by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now, I was allowed to say Ben Jacobs is back with us this morning. Ben, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Very well at my end. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, Leicester before we get to the new coach, uh, new manager at Brighton? How long do you think Brendan Rodgers has here? Is this a situation where he's going to be given some opportunity to turn things around or are we looking at something imminently? Well, I'll re-answer your first question when you said, how am I as a person born and bred in Leicester and as a Leicester fan? And now we're starting with Leicester. I'll change my answer to not very well. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) And not going too good at Leicester, unfortunately. And I think that there's a few considerations with Brendan Rodgers. The defeat against Tottenham as its own entity was bad, but when coupled with a 5-2 loss, against Brighton and really the last 18 months of steady decline it's very difficult for Brendan Rodgers to stay in that position because he's got a dressing room that are short of confidence he's got defenders in particular who are making a number of needless errors he's got foundational cores that are wrong at the football club particularly from set pieces Leicester are conceding for fun from corners as they proved against Tottenham and Brighton as well. But the consideration that the board have got really is twofold. One, financially, can they afford to get rid of Brendan Rodgers because the payoff is around 10 million quid? And then two, do they feel that he still has the coaching ability to turn the side around? And given that he's had no freedom in the last transfer window, and considering what he's done across his whole tenure at the football club, he's always had top half finishes he's won the FA Cup he's had a European run with Leicester can he still turn things around and I think that the fans feel no I think that the dressing room is not refreshed enough due to the lack of new signings I think there's aging players that aren't really going to be able to weigh in and contribute like Jamie Vardy for example so suddenly there becomes pressure on a James Madison you've got someone like Wilfred and Diddy who used to be reliable and isn't really as consistent and bossing games like he used to and then at the back there's of course no Wesley Fofana or Kasper Schmeichel and Danny Ward is proving a bit of a liability as well so when you add all of that up Leicester in big, big trouble. You have to unfortunately look at them as relegation candidates right now. And I think if they could afford to get rid of Brendan Rodgers, they would. So where we stand at the moment is that there will be some talks over the course of the next two days between Brendan Rodgers and the board. And if Rodgers, for example, was to agree to go by mutual consent and help the club financially move on, because it's the right time to make a change, then that will be that. And I think that he'll depart. But there is definitely still a chance at the moment that he'll stay because Leicester can't afford to get rid of him and because at the moment they don't have another replacement lined up. Yeah, and and from his perspective, if you were his agent or his manager, you'd be saying, well, why would you take a pay cut? You won an FA Cup for this crowd. You know, you, you brought them to within uh, moments of Champions League football and so therefore they signed you to this contract. They should honour it. I, I, I understand from the fans' perspective, they're like, well, that's not really, that's, that's not much fun. But can I just, this all seems... Um, like it's a money issue and it's a financial fair play issue apparently is one of the things that's been spoken about but what what was behind the Schmeichel transfer because it feels like he was kind of some kind of totemic figure like uh, the Samson-esque hair once they cut that everything else was revealed Yeah, I think with Schmeichel, it was a case of age, really. And Leicester can't continue to reward well-paid players that won the Premier League when they're slightly past their peak. And Schmeichel's still a very good goalkeeper. I think fans would argue better than Danny Ward. But in his late 30s and towards the end of last season, there was some talk that Brendan Rodgers would start to bring in Ward a bit more with a view to replacing Schmeichel. And there's no way that Schmeichel wanted to stay at Leicester and be a number two. So I think he was looking at his future towards the back end of last season. And maybe his anticipation would have been that Leicester would have brought in another goalkeeper rather than necessarily Ward. Leicester, for example, were looking at Dean Henderson and Dubravka as well, who subsequently went to Manchester United, but as their number one, not as their number two. So Schmeichel's agent was probably looking and he was very high on the wage bill. And even though some fans were shocked by his departure, I think that Leicester just needed to have a bit of a clean out. 
And the financial consideration is partially down to financial fair play, but it's also due to the fact that Leicester are handcuffed because they've spent a lot of money behind the scenes. So that's on the wage bill, which has steadily crept up, particularly for the longer standing players. And you have to do that because if you win the Premier League, if you get to the quarterfinals of a Champions League, if you nearly make UCL football in back-to-back seasons, and then if you finish in the top half, guess what? Every single one of them gets a bonus. And the reason for that is because you're Leicester City Football Club. You're not Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City and so on. So you have to pay these players for every part of success, whether they just miss out on Champions League and end up in the Europa League or whether they finish in the top half. All of that is your yardstick for bonuses. So Schmeichel has been able to cash in much like Vardy every single season and the wage bill creeps up. And then Leicester have also built a fantastic new training facility. They want to expand the King Power Stadium. All of this requires money and it's very difficult for a club like Leicester to stay within financial fair play. So that's part of the consideration with letting Schmeichel go as well. And because Leicester had to sell before they could buy. And because Schmeichel, unlike Fafana, doesn't come with a massive transfer fee, Leicester had no real ability to move over this summer. And I think that when you have a thin squad, you've had injury problems, morale dips, you start conceding goals, and then you can't bring in that extra bit of quality here and there, plus Fafana departing. All of that adds up to a football team that are really in decline at the moment and need to hope they can stabilise in the short term because if they can get through this season and stay up, then because then they won't have that outlay for a new training facility and because they won't imminently have to spend everything to upgrade the King Power Stadium, they might have a bit more freedom to spend some of that Wesley Fofana money, get back up on their feet because on paper, there's still a lot of potential there. But if they slip too far this season and go down, then all that hard work and success of seasons gone by goes straight out the window. Is there any sense that the Rogers message is just kind of worn out a bit with the players? It's a good question. I think the fans see it that way. The decline can't only be seen in the context of a very frustrating summer and the beginning to this season. You have to look at it over the last 18 months and determine whether Brendan Rodgers is now moving the club in the right direction. And ever since, probably Leicester missed out for the second time two seasons back on Champions League football, things have not been going well. And what Rodgers was able to inherit and where the football club was, was pretty strong. And then he was backed by this Thai ownership group and had upwards of 200 million to spend over the course of a couple of windows. But from that point onwards, Leicester didn't clinch Champions League football. A little bit harsh in some respects to say they should have done. But then if you flip it where they were come in the end of the season and even by final day in back-to-back seasons they should have qualified for the Champions League so if you'd have said it at the beginning of the season you might much like when they won the Premier League have been laughed out the room but by the end of that season the fact they didn't make either of those seasons in the top four it was really poor and then last season I think that Leicester just became less of a progressive less of a direct less of a dynamic team far less speedy on the counter-attack far less creative they ended up kind of taking more possession but with less m result and that frustrated the fans because the style of football wasn't as explosive wasn't as energetic and the team just generally didn't look as hungry and then when you take on the fact that Vardy can't be relied on for all the goals there were only a few bright lights that were consistent Madison was one player of the season Fafana was another but beyond that I think Leicester just looked a bit toothless at times they conceded to her easily from set pieces and then uh, at the other end you just had no real belief that they could find enough goals consistently in games after that they conceded to get maximum points and get over the line so the decline has been there for a while and that I think is why if Leicester can afford to get rid of Brendan Rodgers they will uh, One of our commenters <coughs> who um uh, claims the moniker Celtic on YouTube says to be fair to Brendan Leicester have played Arsenal, Manchester United, Chelsea and Spurs already and the next four are against Forest, Bournemouth, Palace and Leeds give him those four to see how he does is he I mean that's not really how football works is it uh, if you're the owners you're like oh our new manager's going to come in and get an immediate bounce we look like geniuses because he's got these four easy games um, that's more likely to happen than them saying well let's give him those four games to turn things around 
Yeah, and also remember when Leicester played Manchester United, Manchester United were not exactly flying. They'd had a little bit of an upturn. They started the season against Brentford. They were 2-0 up. They drew 2-2. They played against Southampton. They were 1-0 up in the game. They lost by two goals to one. They scored early against Brighton. They got hammered 5-2. They took the lead against Tottenham. They got hammered 6-2. So I don't think you can exactly say that Leicester have had a horrific start to the season. Uh, and actually, when they lost away at Chelsea, they played OK in that game. They should have got something from it because Chelsea went down to 10 men pretty early when Conor Gallagher was sent off. So when people look at the fixtures you're taking those teams by name, not by the nature of how they were playing when Leicester actually came up against them. Chelsea was not a particularly difficult fixture for Leicester after they went down to 10 men, which is why they were disappointed to get nothing from the game. Manchester United were better for sure, but let's not forget it wasn't too far after their horrific starts of the season and Leicester were at home that game and historically in the last few seasons have had quite a good record at home to Manchester United a few years back they beat them by five goals to two even so I, I think that Rodgers will only be given time because either Leicester is still lining up their ducks lining up their finances and lining up a replacement and then if there is an upturn in form who knows the board might reconsider because they are a little bit patient and uh, they have been historically uh, as well but you know if there wasn't that 10 million right there in terms of compensation then i think rogers would have been gone already over the weekend one last thing about this before we move on um there's a, a perception outside of of leicester that actually rogers has done quite a good job and won't be too damaged by what's going on here but listening to what you're saying about the team becoming a possession base but not having any cut and thrust like that's not really how football works at the moment those managers uh, don't tend to be very successful at the elite level is there still a possibility that Brendan Rodgers becomes an elite manager or has that ship sailed for him do you think well, I think he's damaged in the sense of if you flash back three seasons to when Leicester were flying and then there was the COVID break, they entered into that COVID break uh, around about double digits clear the fifth place, which is why it was so disappointing when football resumed that they didn't make Champions League football. So at that point, I think he's in the conversation for the Manchester United job, which ended up coming up and other elite level gigs. Now he's not in that conversation. Brighton, for example, considered him, but then never moved or even started conversations and instead obviously moved on to De Zerbi instead, who ended up being their only candidate. And that sort of tells you everything really that teams of that potentially Villa or Everton, if there ends up being vacancies there, uh, not really looking at him anymore. And I don't think Brendan would have any problem, by the way, walking into the Everton job if that ever became available despite his Liverpool links. So is his reputation damaged? Well, not necessarily because people understand the financial constraints at Leicester and he remains a great coach. He remains a good man manager. He remains an excellent developer of young talent. And I think that the board and sporting directors at various clubs he's been on, for example, that recruitment model at Liverpool, really enjoyed working with him. He's a people person. But I think where he's fallen is kind of almost staying in touch with the game. And it moves so quickly. And I think that the managers now that are gaining real success, are able to be quite fluid with their formations. They're able to change from a back three to a back four. They're very embracing of data and of science. And I think that Rogers has got his way and it is to some extent science and data driven, but when it doesn't work, because he likes to keep the ball and because he likes to change pace and play on the counter-attack at times too when he doesn't have the ball. All of that can get quite exposed if you lack creativity because you have so much of the ball that is there for all to see that you're short of ideas. Yeah. So I think he lacks that bit of creativity now. He lacks that perhaps flexibility tactically to change a game and that's the one thing that I've been disappointed in over the last 18 months that Rogers, when things are flying, great. The confidence just builds momentum. The team is hungry. The talent's there for all to see. And he's got a real eye for talent. But when things aren't working now, those tactical changes, whether personnel or formation, aren't working for him. And when you look at that over 18 months rather than just the first seven games of the season, I think that tells you that he has 
lost uh, a little bit of nous and for want of a better word i don't mean this too derogatory intelligence to really turn the game around on that i think like it, it's so difficult now in terms of the evolution of the game and as as ben says just like the the good manager a few years ago now has a totally different task and it's 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 not easy like most managers are going to end up as failures because well, that's the way that's the that's, that's the, the game, ball game but it's just and that's like why they... when you look at Tuchel and you're like you know there were circumstances there but there's so much going on in terms of um, tactical now obviously data um, you know the young the young guy of today is a little bit different to maybe the young guy of ten years ago, but it's seriously, seriously difficult and you just have to keep evolving, I yeah. think. And you know, I, I I'm I'm not gonna lie and say I know enough about Brendan Rogers to say that he's not like that, but it's difficult. It's very, very it difficult. It is. Maybe you're off even exactly Klopp, you look at needs, Klopp now, you're like, you know? Klopp, does Klopp have to evolve to you know? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. I mean he we'll see. I think the time off is going to do Liverpool quite well. Uh, let's talk about the situation at Brighton. They've uh, announced that or will announce tomorrow at least that Roberto De Gerbi is going to be their new manager and he fits into that structure really well. What do you know about this guy? Yeah, I think it's a really good appointment. In the end, it was the only candidate that Brighton seriously explored. And you can look at his time at Shakhtar and obviously due to the war, he chose to leave that club. So he's been in a state of limbo, really waiting for his next big job. But we can also judge him from his time at Sassuolo as well, where he took a very small club and got two eighth place finishes in Serie A and almost qualified for European football as well in the Europa Conference League. And he's a very good fit for Brighton, his two preferred formations, a 3-4-3 and 4-3-3. And he can interchange between them pretty freely. And I think what will work within how Brighton play is, first of all, there's some similarities with Graham Potter and his style. And second of all, he's a very patient coach. He likes to build slowly from the back and then have a lot of turns of paces. So you'll see Brighton have a fair amount of the ball. You'll see them play quite calmly and methodically and safely at the back. And then out of nowhere, you'll see turns of paces and quick movements forwards, which can be quite unsettling for teams. And therefore, he'll be looking to bring in players over time that are very hungry and have got a lot of speed. And we saw at Sassuolo and also Shakhtar as well that he likes a change of direction, a diagonal ball either on the ground or even one or two long balls as well. Not as many as uh, perhaps Brighton have played before. We, we saw Graham Potter quite like those sort of chip balls or uh, long balls, but safe long balls that change the direction. De Zebri uh, perhaps likes to keep the ball on the ground a little bit more. And he also likes to go through the centre as well. So uh, the role of the wide players uh, will very much be to kind of make the pitch as big as possible, but to do a lot of work off the ball and then when they're actually involved on the ball he'll want them to cut inside at least to be part of the phase of play so to move in quickly and play a short pass and then to get back out wide or to start out wide and then to burst into the box so we're going to see a lot of efforts from this Brighton side under him to play very centrally and to be fast and to take teams by surprise and Potter was like that to some extent as well. So I think he'll be very good. We've also seen him work with young players at Shakhtar. For example, he had Mudrik, the so-called Ukrainian Neymar, who's done very well in the Champions League so far with two goals in two games. And that's good news because Brighton's mentality is to bring some of these young players through. So when you look at the mid-20s or beyond, like a Trossard, or a Gross or a Welbeck or a Lalana, uh, they're there because they're solid Premier League players. Webster falls into that category as well, uh, who can make sure that Brighton stabilise uh, and try and stay where they are in the table or somewhere close, pushing for either top half or European football. But uh, beneath that, you've got the excellent Alexis McAllister, you've got Moses Caicedo, you've got Purvis Estepinian, who's effectively replaced Mark Kukure, you've got Tarek Lamptey and Levi Colwell, who's on loan from Chelsea. And those young players 
are Brighton's future. Even though Colwell was only on loan, they'd love the ability to sign him. I don't think that Chelsea would allow it. And that's where I think that De Zerbi is going to be very useful to Brighton because he's kind of accustomed to bringing through young talent. He's a real tactician. So when we talk about developing a young player, what do we mean? Well, there's the data side that he's very big on. So projecting your development literally in numbers and working out where there is scope to improve. And then there's that intelligence in terms of what are your weaknesses and how can you develop and how do you actually learn from that day on day? Well, it's watching videos, it's running through game management style scenarios to try and get better positioning or uh, better control of the game and work out how you can improve under pressure. And then there is perhaps that final aspect with young talent of just actual match time yeah. and you're not going to learn unless you're playing and given the opportunities and when does the manager think you're right and that's down to kind of gut instinct and risk reward at some times like look at Arsenal bringing on a 15 year old but they're 3-0 up in the game so you can do that and that's the call of the manager and I think that this is where he's going to be very strong because he's used to kind of taking underdogs and improving them and quickly as well we saw this uh, Swolo, most notably, he really was able to take a team almost instantaneously and improve their amount of time on the ball, improve their um, directness and their clinical nature in the final third, improve their defensive numbers, all within a kind of nine-month period. And if you look at the graph of all of the key metrics, they just went through the roof. So that's all very good news for Brighton. And I think there will hopefully be quite a smooth transition, therefore, from him uh, taking over from Graham Potter because they share a lot of the same values. All right. Ben, good good to have you with us again. Thanks a million for that. Cheers. All the best. It's uh, Ben Jacobs there from CBS Galazzo. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. If you want to get in touch, uh, we'd love to hear from you this morning. Uh, Richard Mander says, if you're picking a West Brom player on form, it has to be Malumbi at the moment. Mm. Malumbi in the team, doing well. He, it's great. He could, yeah, he's definitely in the, in the, like, I haven't seen West Brom, but he's, he's, he's getting a lot of good... Rep- um, getting a lot of good reaction and his energy as well would it, I, I'm not I mean a little bit disappointed with Malumbi for Ireland um, but I know still so, young still young and a lot of far better judges than me at international level yeah stage, and so. need, needed game time because it was I wasn't really sure where his club career was going and um, that midfield you know that midfield position is kind of up for grabs yeah, especially if Knight plays right wing back, which, you know, mm. I don't think he will, but he might. Uh, the Kerry dominance chat post-final seems very, very premature now, says Callum Whelan. Uh, the dubs are obviously quaking in their boots with O'Rourke at the wheel, obviously, says Porrick Stack. Cry laughing emoji. Mm. Um, that's it on the dubs at the moment. Uh, Ireland's greatest ever player, Collins, didn't have a good weekend, says John Claffey. I think... Um, I think it's okay to be excited about young talent coming through. Is that not the whole point of being a, a fan of any sport? It's like the future is there's a good day coming, be it ever so far away. Yeah. Um, is that what the plaque on the side of Doyle says? Yeah, and in fairness, like they were 2 0 down. He took Jack Grealish out, you know. Let's just hope he goes seamlessly back into the team, but I don't think it'll affect his performance against Scotland. Uh, I thought Liverpool would be in green for not dropping points this weekend, says Richard Rebels. Hey, there we go. Right, time for the sports pages. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean, a spoofer? He's just bullshit. Ah, no, I haven't. Come on, don't, don't be. No, I'm not. Yes. No. At 8.37 this morning, we're bringing you what's in the uh, sports pages. The front of uh, the Irish Independent, Derry Clear Rovers Cup Hurdle. Victory over Dublin is a shot in the arm for the domestic games. It shows League of Ireland champions are not way ahead. It's good to see the chasing packs as Eamon Sweeney. Yeah, good. it's nice to see that front page. Um, obviously with my League of Ireland hat on, but just Michael Duffy. His his goal against Bowes um in the league recently was unbelievable, and I'm kind of delighted for him. One thing I didn't mention about Derry, um, Ger, that like when Stephen Kenny achieved all that at Dundalk there was basically nobody from Dundalk on the team. Like, and that's that's they were pretty much all Irish players, but. It would be a small point. Like, I'm a Galway Knights fan. I do want Galway players on the team, and I certainly want players in the region. Derry is absolutely full of players from Ulster and from Derry as well, and a manager from Limavady who clearly loves the club, and boy, do they love Michael Duffy. And Patrick McElhinney, given the captaincy role, um, was an interesting call. He wouldn't be the most 
kind of shouty uh, fell on the pitch but his stats uh, yesterday apparently were amazing but he had a brilliant brilliant game and that's the beauty of this Derry story as well they've had so much hardship with the deaths of Mark Farron and Ryan McBride they've had so much hardship in that city in general this is a good time for them yeah no for sure um, the Irish Independence want to point this out has an extract from uh, our own Arthur James O'Dee's book it's called Limerick A Biography in Nine Lives and so uh, it's been a long time in the making it's in the shops now you should get your hands on a copy it's um, right up to modern times, but also looking back at some of the legends from Limerick and uh, there's an amazing story about the fallout from when Limerick lost, when Tom Ryan was the manager. It goes into fantastic detail. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to buy the book for it. But. He never even told me about this book. I mean, he's just a man of very few, like he just keeps his cards. I was literally texting me yesterday about something entirely different. Never even heard of this book. And the man can write. Yeah. yeah. So Dark Horse is what you're saying. A dark horse, yeah, a horse that is um, hasn't really seen the track that much yet in terms of, but he has now. Uh, back in blue, McCaffrey and Mannion to rejoin us. We'll do something with Arthur about his book, by the way, uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks. But it should be on your Christmas list. Uh, Bowl slammed is embarrassing. Arsenal make it look like child's play by picking a child. It's kind of embarrassing. It's a real screw you to Brentford, isn't it? You're picking a fifteen-year-old. Is yeah, it? is it a little bit? Um, we had a much younger kid playing in the Irish League in recent days as well. 15 and a half to me is, I think that's fair enough. Do you think so? Yeah, it's 3 up. And as long as you... With the strength and conditioning that players have now? I think it's different though. I think, um, I've spoken to Stephen Bradley and a few managers about this in Ireland. It's, it's a different game now and it's a younger game as well. As long as you're, if you're, you're not going to be kicked necessarily by the opposition, so... Uh, oh, there we go. Greeley, sorry. Collins waited in tunnel after the match to apologise to Jack. So in association with Screwfix. Um, hey. <laughs> uh, uh, Grealish said that he wasn't sore. It was his leg which hurt the most after Collins' studs went down his body. It's just his leg. Looks in some Nick Grealish in fairness. So um, a big goal for him as well in the first minute of the game. He can take it, yeah. Back in blue... Double trouble. They're the tabloid headlines on the dubs. Uh, Dublin going to win the All Ireland now, according to Johnny. It's a shoe in. The, I'd say that. The Jacks are back. Yeah. It's a picture of the two lads covered in the gold streamers. It's seven and thirteen on them. Uh, and then, if you hate the royal family, clap your hands. Is the banner um, as uh, from the Celtic fans in the away end as they were beaten two 0 yesterday. So um, it's been an interesting. The sport has been an interesting kind of lightning rod for it people's. Uh, I, you're not getting arrested at a football ground if you hold that up but if you hold that up while the cortege is passing by you're getting arrested yeah it's, um, it's an interesting or democracy it is it, you know a democracy yeah it's deja blue tab of the morning yep you like that one alright the rest of them are um, the 15 year old Premier League Federer could still miss his finale because of the injury right it's going to be a last minute decision about his uh, participation in the, in the um, and De Zerbi gets the Brighton job but they're not announcing it officially until tomorrow out of respect to the Queen. She, she wouldn't want it any other way. Um, no. She, you know, the Brighton Brighton should not man, name their manager until... The biggest story, done. but the biggest story with the whole uh, death of Her Majesty was how the Shinners have handled it. They've just somehow turned what could have been absolute, like, so many difficulties and they've, they've just emerged incredibly well out of it it's, I, I just find it hilarious actually the big winners are uh, are Sinn Féin as you say and Bertie Ahern seems to be the other one it's like <laughs> <laughs> what, what amazing uh, yeah, you know <laughs> so there you go it's 8.42 this morning Colin Mulaney's with us Colin what's going on hey lads how's it going still oh, reeling sorry. the death of the Queen <laughs> sorry that was your sports pages yeah. <laughs> there are so many idiots out there so many spoofers there's a lot of horse I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean, a spoofer? He's a bullshit. Ah, no, I haven't. Come on, don't be, don't be. No, I'm not. Yes. Right. No. Right. Carl Milani is with us. Carl, how are you? Hello, lads. What's how are you going doing? on? All well. And yourselves? Where's the. You, you brought out a book as well, have you? Not yet. Uh, yeah, actually. Yeah. You brought out a book, yeah, yeah. on Sligo. Yeah, same. Where, where's your book, Jer? I mean, we're, what, 100 years together in this game? Yeah. No books? No books. 
You keep, you keep, you keep telling everybody about your great idea for a book, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's a newspaper, not a book. And if the tax, if the VAT comes down on newspapers, got to bring out a Sunday sports paper, haven't you? Just need a backer. With no, I hadn't heard that one. Sorry, you keep telling yeah. about the journeyman jockey. That's your book. Oh idea. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Tough. I have great ideas. You're like the secret. You put it out there, and then it'll come back to you. Except somebody else will have written it. <laughs> Colin Arthur, two of the young pups of the game. They've already both brought out a book. There you go. There's a book on you, Johnny. Definitely. Yeah, how are you? Have anyway? you written a book, no? No. Not yet. No. I'd love to bring out a Sunday sports newspaper. I think there's a, if the VAT goes down to 0% in the budget on papers, I mean, I just need the backing of a lot of money. Be great though, and I mean, I imagine the, the coverage off the ball will give a Sunday sports paper. You're every just Sunday. Um, just getting into the game as as the game you is, know, is you, dying. You know the like the opening scenes of The Sopranos. Tony's like, "Did you ever get the feeling you come in at the end?" Yeah, <laughs> you'd be like, "Yeah, I'm gonna launch a newspaper. That's what the future. <laughs> the future of the media is like, newspapers." Like Sta- the now I realize like... this sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Stick with me. <laughs> Print costs going through the roof. Nobody reading things anymore. But I'm the man. That's the pitch. <laughs> be a good read though um, what's going on not a whole lot did you watch the what you think of Derry City yesterday I thought they were outstanding I yeah. thought they I thought Shamrock Rovers looked like they were playing in Europe they couldn't get on the ball Jack Byrne lost the battle with Dummigan um, Patrick McElhenney like the midfield of Duffy McElhenney Diallo um, who am I missing Patching and is, is Dummigan did I mention the five midfielders serious yeah. serious Patrick's such a good player yeah good for the league though it's if, very good if for Rovers it, like, no it, cakewalk next season it, it does take a billionaire yeah. to help them to get to this point which you know not great but at the same time um, maybe I, I, like, I like to call you on that though because as much as they're, they will be paying their players quite well I think Derry are getting good crowds they're generally local players and I don't think they're absolute, they're like lashing money at it Like so it's not like uh, we're buying success here obviously they haven't won anything yet but they have a local team they have a local spirit and I think there's more to it than that albeit they are backed by one of four clubs I think the League of Ireland now backed by a billionaire I think they were quite oh, shrewd in the players that they signed as well they signed, they've signed brilliantly they have the off like, I thought they would challenge all the way for the league title I know they're there they thereabouts they might just yes Rovers, they are, might. Rovers have shells I think on Thursday I think is that yeah. right That that's a definitely a game that they may not win yeah. um, which would make it interesting and you've got the European commitments through to the end of the season but mm. I think Derry City they're, they're definitely looking at a, a longer term model I would think to challenge yeah and that's the, the league needs the yeah. you can't just have a, a Rosenberg or whoever your gardens. Did they also dominate? I was mixing them up somebody. Um, we should talk a little bit about the golf. Roy McElroy really gave himself far too much to do. He was yeah, still in it, but actually the triple bogey, was it a double bogey or triple at the first? Didn't help. No, it didn't. And McElroy, the bits I saw this week at the golf, McElroy didn't play well at all, uh, but he was still contended, which shows where he's at. But yesterday he was very, on the front line in particular, very, very wild off the tee. And obviously, as you say, that poor start, and then he hits it in the water uh, coming down the stretch as well, which put paid to his chances. Uh, you know, he just didn't seem to play well this week at all. He had some a lot, big misses off the tee uh, at various stages, which really hurt his chances. And, you know, he had the likes of Fitzpatrick and, and McIntyre played brilliantly yesterday and really timed his run to perfection and won in the playoff against Fitzpatrick then as well, which is a huge boost to him. And I would be very surprised if he isn't there next year as part of the European Ryder Cup team. Well, I was going to say, when McElroy was pouring scorn on the live golfers, he was one of the guys that was name-checked, which must have been a big boost for him. You know, oh, OK, all right, it's good. You think I'm great. And then for him to back it up, that's a good sign. Mm. Yeah, and I think uh, they have looked at McIntyre and those guys as definitely the future of the European team, guys in their 20s like that, and he was brilliant yesterday absolutely brilliant I mean I watched him on the front line yesterday and he hit four or five approach shots to within uh, kick in distance really and he was just in superb form all the way around and kept that going and then won the playoff uh, brilliantly against Fitzpatrick who's a guy that's in form as well um, interesting golf course I think the rough was quite deep um, in, in various places and McElroy spoke at the start of the week that he was looking at this week as a chance to see the golf course and they met up I think some of them to chat about how they might set it up to their advantage next year, yeah, uh, which is a big part of the Ryder Cup in terms of using those advantages uh, as best you can. And they will need uh, a lot of help, I think, because the USA look quite strong. But it looks like a golf course that, if you drive the ball well, it's definitely scorable. And McIlroy probably didn't drive the ball as well as he, he needed to this week. Um, a lot of woods off tees and stuff like that, but still, he was, he was very wavered yesterday, I thought, in the front line, which, which didn't help at all. 
Um, but all things considered, quite a good week for him, and he's still going to probably uh, win the race to Dubai as well, uh, given where he is in the standings. So, uh, how long is it? When do they actually hit Dubai? Yeah, it's later on this year. Usually, I think in November time. Usually, right. Uh, around then but um, I'm not quite sure what the schedule is this year I think it's usually around then but like I mean that would be a fantastic year for him if he won both sides of the Atlantic with the FedEx and not the race bad, to Dubai yeah. but no major I realise that um, you know, the money doesn't matter of course <laughs> yeah <laughs> no He's, not at all money matters less to him than any other golfer he said uh, anything else going on well uh, make of the dubs I think they're favourites for the All-Ireland no Kerry are actually the favourites you think? Well, they are with the bookmakers. But well, you think Con O'Callaghan comes back in as well? Yeah. From well, what, if, what if Con's injured? What if Mannion's injured? Like, but what if, how is, what if David injured? Clifford is injured? Uh, They're literally toast. However, toast. however, however, David Clifford not injured in Championship. Mm. Con O'Callaghan has been injured in Championship, mm. not just once, right? Paul Mannion has also been injured. Was a sub yeah. the last time. Mm. Like, wasn't a starter on the team. And Jack McCaffrey's been away for many years. There's like a, a mad kind of, yes, we're going to be, this is going to be amazing. Everybody's going to be exactly the way they were in the absolute peak of their game. They're not. You can't just magic it back like that. You can't. Whereas what we have in Kerry is a situation where uh, hell has been unleashed. Like that team now has confidence. Coming down the stretch of an all Ireland final, they've done there and been that. The only done team... Been that. The only team... Your confidence is gone, Jer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, though. Like d- The only team in the country who had that was Dublin. Mm. And now they've done it to Dublin. It's like a massive fl- uh, switch is flicked. Mm. Everything is flipped. Struggling with words this morning. What about Kildare? I mean, what about Kildare? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> is there any anything to be said for, Le- for Leinster next year? No. Yada, no. Yada. no, it's the, it's not Leinster. It's just making sure that you're in the round robin after mm. that. The provincial championships are, have never been less important mm. than they will be next season. Yeah. Mm. And that's another thing to consider. For I know Kevin McStay has spoken about the Mayo situation, that they need to develop a deeper squad. Yeah. And, you know, if you add these guys back into the Dublin squad, it becomes a whole lot deeper all of a sudden. And they've got Division 2 of the Allianz League to blood more players if they need That's to. That's mad when you think about it, yeah. So, I mean, I You're think You're making the favourites. I think they're favourites. I, I, I think, make them favourites, yeah. I think Kerry are absolutely the favourites. And if those two teams meet tomorrow, Kerry are, Kerry are favourites. Yeah, but it's not tomorrow. How do Kerry react to being all Ireland champions as well? Yeah, I don't absolutely. Know. They're, they're going to have a few less points, according to Ger. I think so. I Hard think to do in Kerry. I think they're going to be absolutely... They're going to have... This is a, a nice cold shower for them in September. And they're thinking, right, let's be having you, lads. Let's be having you. Let's see what you're like. I think, that, I think that carry defence in particular are going to be looking forward to going up against yeah. Mannion and Con yeah. next season going, we had to listen to everybody saying our All-Ireland had a little asterisk beside it because you weren't there. Well, you're here now, buddy. What are you going to do? Yeah, Miles sledging. It's going to be fascinating yeah. next year. Because I think Mayo are going to have a kick in them with, uh, with Kevin McStay. Go, we're going to be there, thereabouts. Mm. Donegal, Monaghan, depends on who they appoint as manager, but you'd imagine if they get high-profile appointments in that they'll get a bit of a kick as well. Tyrone have to surely do better. Tyrone well, I don't know. Be I don't know. Conor McCann has gone back to Australia. I think that's a that's a massive, massive blow to them. Much, yeah. I think that it, it's, it suggests that things aren't as well as we thought they were. Now, mind you, the, um, the Canavan kids will be around and ready to go and that under-20s team were absolutely sensational. So we'll see. All right, Carl, anything else? Uh, just some rowing to look out for this morning. Uh, lots of Irish rowers in action at the World Rowing Championships in the Czech Republic. The women's four among those in action at about 10 to 11 this morning. Afra Kioi, Merlam, Fiona Murta and Emily Hegarty uh, in action there. You mentioned Brighton appointing Roberto de Zerbi as their new head coach on a proposed four-year contract. That's subject to a work permit. There's racing today at both Ferry House and Listole as well. The first in the uh, Listole is off at 2.35 and then the action at Ferry House underway. Uh, from 20 past three. All right, good stuff. Thanks very much for that call. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now, turning our attention back to the Premier League, I'm delighted to say Martin Lipton is with us. Martin, good morning to you. How are you? I'm very well, actually. How are you? Spurs uh, nailed on to be second now after that performance yesterday. Sorry, I misheard that. Are Spurs nailed on to be second now after that performance yesterday? No. They still haven't played well. This is a bizarre thing. They haven't played well all season and yet they're, you know, third in the league. I don't quite know how it happens. Um, I think the interesting thing on, on Saturday, A, obviously Son scoring is really important, but the tactical change in the second half when Bissouma came on, 
is one that the a lot of the fans have been asking for to play with the midfield three rather than the two to stop being outnumbered um and that did appear to have an impact but then you've got to make a decision on who your right wing back is and that's where there'll be division i think it's fair to say between the supporters what, and what, the manager what's the division well the supporters want anybody but emerson and the manager wants emerson <laughs> that's the mm. division I think there's a, an argument that you play Kulisevsky right wing back. I think that could be an option, but you've got to then make him work defensively because he hasn't had to do that in the past. Uh, but it is interesting. But the reality is that yeah. they've got they've scored you know second or third highest number of goals. They've got a really good relative um, defence in terms of goals they conceded. But you watched that first half on Saturday, and that that could have been five four either way at half time. Where is where is Young Darty in all this? At the moment, he's not. Um, Conte says he's still not recovered from the injury he got at the end of last season. And that must be true because you'd have wanted a plan. Because before the injury, he looked for the first time like the player they thought they were signing. And he was excellent for a period of about two months. And then he got injured, missed the end of the season and hasn't had a kick since. Now, that must be because he's not recovered properly from the from the operation. It's a really long season. They're going to play loads and loads of games. I, I do think he's going to get an opportunity and just hope that, um, from our perspective, that he's ready when it does. But it, it's a really interesting squad at the moment. And it, it is interesting to see that a manager of, of his standing in the game and with that track record is still willing to be tactically flexible and take risks and be adventurous when it comes to changing things around. That's a really positive sign, I would argue. Well, yeah, I think you have to be able to do that and to be willing to... To, to change the shape if circumstances de- determine that. I, I think that, you know, the best teams are able to to have a framework and play off the cuff, as it were, within that and make, make slight tweaks and alterations, sometimes change things completely, uh, just to unhinge and, and unsettle the opponent. And I think you need to, to have that. I mean, the thing that helps Spurs, of course, is they know they're going to score goals. You know, even if Kane isn't anywhere near his sharpest, he's still got... Six in seven in the Premier League, and he's probably playing at about seventy percent of his effective. Really, yeah, yeah. I mean, his, his touch isn't quite there. His final ball's not quite there. The odd pass is there, but not enough of it. You know, you you, you know, there's a lot more to come from Kane, and yet he's still scoring goals. This is a huge uh, benefit. And it's, it's why going back two or three years, when he wasn't fit, he would still play because he was still the most likely score, source of goals, even when he's not playing well, because also Kane creates space for others. Because you ha- you can't leave him. You can't let him pick up the ball and turn because he'll shoot and score potentially. And if you get too tight, it cre- it leaves space in behind. He's a real problem just for being there because you know what he can do. Um, and obviously for Tottenham, Son coming on and scoring goals and banishing those clouds of doubt that had started to to weigh over him is is a huge thing. What happened There's there? Still Martin? something missing though. What happened there? Because. Um... You know, just it looked like obviously it was a confidence thing, bit of a hangover from how well he did last season. Um, he, he his his stats w- would suggest he wasn't dribbling as much. Blah 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 blah. Comes on and gets a hat trick. Yeah, because football is played in the head. You know, mm. between the, 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 that sort of foot of real estate between your ears is where it matters. He was losing faith in himself because things weren't working. He admitted that uh, after the game. One kick of the ball changes everything, uh, and I think it was always likely to. That once he scored one, I don't think I don't think you say he scores one and scores a hat trick in thirteen minutes. But you score one, you expect him to score quite a few because of the quality of the player he is. Um, and lo and behold, Spurs could probably do without the international break now because he'd be absolutely flying going into Arsenal in a fortnight. But it is a fortnight, and uh, half of that squad goes away for Nations League and other World Cup feeling games with no idea what sort of shape they're going to be coming in when they get back. Yeah, the the, the um, I'm not sure if the buses were running at all, obviously in London this weekend, but it was put to him. It's like a London bus. Three come along at once. I'm not really sure that happens, but are ten going to oh, come along at once? Oh, it really does. <laughs> are ten going to come along at once now? Um, well, I hope so. Particularly, if they've got some tough games coming up. Look, I think if you look across the the league, the two best teams in the league this season are the current top two, actually, City and. Arsenal and City, they've been the best two teams. And then probably the third best team are in third. But Spurs haven't played as well as the other two, and they haven't played as well as they can. But as a staging post for the season, you definitely take four points dropped out of 21 after seven matches. 
There's no question about that. It's a, it's a great position to be in going into the international break. Having said that, the caveat is who have they played? Yeah, and what's the your style, to... Martin? Like, because I watched them against. Um... It's, it's it's bizarre when you think back now. Against Chelsea, they were very, very subservient in that game. Didn't have much of the ball. And I'm like, what what's the shape of this Spurs team in terms of possession-based football this season? Have they a way of... What is this actual style? Because they obviously are scoring a lot of goals. I think he's, it's, it's a counter-attacking strategy at the moment, unquestionably. That may change with if he goes with the midfield three because that will immediately give them more ball protection. Um, with If that three are... Probably Basuma, Hoberg and Bentancourt. But remember, a fit skip comes into the reckoning there as well. And he hasn't kicked a ball yet this season. Literally not kicked a ball in the first team because of the injury at the end of last year. Uh, he gives them energy as well. They can then protect the ball better. They may be a better team in terms of having possession. But the setup thus far has been sit in deep and then hit on the counter. I mean, you could argue it's rather Mourinho-esque. Uh, and that period under Mourinho when they were at top of the league in the first half of the season in the sort of the COVID hit or yeah, the early, the late starting COVID season, the 21-2 season. No, 20, I'll lose track of time. 2021 season when there were no crowds and they, they were top of the league just before Christmas playing counter-attack and nothing else. It's funny because um, you, you bring up Mourinho. <laughs> Nuno was still the manager this time last year. It's an incredible turnaround because... Like the the football might not have been, um, I don't know. The, the style of play might not be a million miles away, but it's far more effective. And the transformation of the club since Conte has arrived is, I I I, I don't want to say unparalleled because somebody's going to point something out. But I don't remember a turnaround as pronounced in such a short period of time. Well, I do assume that uh, Conte has membership of the Magic Circle or something like that because he certainly pulled a trick on Tottenham and turned them into a football club. Uh, it's been quite remarkable. The, the effort the players put in, they, you know, they were lazy, you could say. That'd be unfair under Nuno, but they didn't do any running. They didn't ha- he didn't want them to run. Conte runs them into the ground. And it's no surprise that if you run a team that hard, they, they stay fit. And it's made a difference. They're able to stay in matches until the end. They'll score late goals because they're just that 1% or 2% fitter than the opposition. It helps. Um, His comments after the or before the game at, on Saturday, I thought were, were quite notable. Where he's like, "We we bought Richarlison because we need a really really good fourth striker, not a young player that you have to trust." Because this is this is Spurs. The Spurs I want Spurs to be not the Spurs, which was a, a history of failure, basically a history of just being good but not really being that good and not really caring. Where he's like, he basically is saying, "I want to change the mindset of this club." That's it. He measures the, the, the merit of a manager by the trophies he's got on his sideboard. It's as simple as that. It's a, very, it's a very easy calculation. He's not interested in development. He's not interested in long-term planning. Yeah, that's nice to have. He's interested in winning. He wants to say, look what I won. Uh, and again, there's a Mourinho-esque trait there as well, to be fair. I mean, the two are not dissimilar. Um, the difference being that Conti alienates boards and Mourinho, it seems, alienates players. Yeah, uh, so neither lasts as long as maybe you <laughs> might want them to but well uh, as things are going we'll see Conte's definitely going to get this season it feels I say that now and sure look uh, <laughs> they can play that clip back to me at the end of the season if that doesn't work out I would never say anything for certain look, I, I think though that the, the view is that they'll that he at the moment seems quite happy there uh, I saw there was the stuff from Italy yesterday you know Juventus want him and he fell out with Juventus. Why is he going to go back? Uh, I think that's unlikely. You never know. I mean, never say never in football. But at the moment, he's, he's the happy place is Tottenham. Uh, they've given him what he wants and they promised him more of what he wants in January and again next summer. So there'll be a sort of continued uh, renewal of the squad. Uh, and he works very well with Parici, the, um, the the general manager or sporting director or whatever his, his title is at, at Tottenham. They work hand in glove. They've known each other for a long time. Daniel Levy has basically said to the, the the football side of the club, you know, I'll do the deals if I have to, but you sort them out. That seems to be working. They bought in seven, eight players over the summer. They got rid of the ones they didn't want in the main. The only exception being uh, Brian Hill. And, and even he's, you know, been talked up by, by Conti as having a chance to play. So it's a much happier ship than it's been for a very long time. Can we talk about an unhappy ship at the moment? And that's going on at West Ham, where David Moyes was critical of the players in the aftermath of the game, which is obviously always a dangerous 
line to tread. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. What do you think is going to happen at West Ham with Moyes this season? Uh, well, I hope that nothing stupid happens because, you know, he's the reason they've done so well over the last couple of years. And he's trying to bring new new bodies in and make a difference. I thought they should have got something out of the game. It wasn't a great game yesterday. Uh, and if the, the shot hits the, the hits the post, comes in rather than comes out, they get at least a draw and probably there's a momentum shift and they might go on and win it. I mean, they were they were creating havoc at the set pieces, weren't they? And it just wouldn't go in. It was one of those those days. But then you look at the table and think, oh, dear. That's not clever. And, and it isn't clever. I mean, they are where they are for a reason. The European results have been really positive, though. They've played, played well in those games. Uh, and you think, well, why can't they take that European form into, into the domestic games? And I think that would be the thing that would help. Is it, it isn't as if they're getting battered every match or struggling to win. They're winning, the, as it were, the wrong matches. Uh, and they need to start winning some of the league games. Uh, but the longer it goes on... You know, with the reality of it and that what's at stake if you get it wrong in the Premier League, we're talking, you know, millions and millions of pounds, then it can be a bit twitchy. I think you well, can't see them being silly enough to to want to make a change before um, the World Cup break, but they might do during it if things haven't improved. Is, is Mark Noble's loss in the dressing room a thing at all? I'm just wondering how... You know, we we spoke about Bohemians this year. Like they've they've they lost their their main driving force in the midfield, more of a character. They've fallen off a cliff. They've become a soft, soft team all of a sudden. Um, is that any of an issue at all? Well, it wasn't really much of a feature on the pitch, was he last season? Mm. But maybe in the dressing room and at training, he was. I mean, the expectation was that Declan Rice in particular would fill that void and and take it up. And I mean, has he? Well, I don't think he's playing badly. I mean, so, but I don't know what, I genuinely have no idea what sort of character he is in the dressing room. I've never been in a dressing room with Mark Noble or mm. Declan Rice, so I can't, I can't tell. Um, sometimes it just, you know, with new players, it, it takes them a bit longer to, to feel at home mm. um, and to feel confident in themselves. And there's a bit of a transition in the way they want to play, I think, at times. I mean, th- there were moments yesterday when you thought Antonio is going to win this game on his own because he was bossing various elements of it and it never quite came off. Last season, at this stage, that they were all coming off. He was scoring goals and he was creating goals. And you know, this year, he scored one in seven. He hasn't played any differently. It's just not quite working. It, you get those moments, don't you? And it can it can change. In as Son showed on on Saturday, with one kick of the ball. Can we ask a, a little bit about uh, Arsenal and the situation? They've they've bounced back from the setback against Manchester United really well, and that's the sign of a team who are unified and have you know well coached ideas and the ideas are being carried out by the players like you, again you've got to be impressed by the turnaround that Arteta has affected from you think to Aubameyang being pictured driving his Batmobile late to the North London Derby and getting caught in traffic to this team at the weekend where they're introducing a 15 year old and it's 3-0 and against a team who they've had struggles with just last season um, again he's doing a very good job at the moment they've been the best team in the league so far without question they've been excellent um, and I even, even in the United game you could argue the biggest mistake they made was to equalise, because at that point they were so much in control, and then they sort of lost their focus. And he made he tried to be to win it by making a change, where actually if he kept in the same things, they'd have won it because they were the better team. But you know, these things happen. But that was a big win for them, particularly with you know no Odegaard and issues. The question is squad depth. What have they got outside the top, the first 13, 14? That may become more of an issue as the season goes on particularly if you look at the number of matches that people are playing in the next month, it's going to be, it really is the killing fields of football, really, in some ways. It's going to be brutal, the the impact of it, unless you have a rotation or the ability to rotate within the squad, because it's, I think it's six league matches um, by the end of October. Arsenal only got five because they don't play that City game, but they've also got European matches in the voice. We're talking about 10, 11 matches over the course of 31 days, all of them high intensity. Uh, but up to this point, you can't argue uh, against what Arsenal were doing. Uh, Jesus has scored goals. Saka looks refreshed. Xhaka has been excellent. Uh, the defence with uh, White, an unlikely right back, has worked really well. Saliba has been um, the player that they thought they, they were going to get all those years ago, two, three years ago when they originally signed him and then sent him back on loan for a couple of seasons. Um, you know, Ramsdale's kept well. They, they haven't shown a weakness yet, apart from that silly 20 minutes at United when they threw away a game they should have won. 
I think they'll be very, very pleased, and rightly so. And that comes down to the players trusting in Arteta. Um, I'm not sure what I'd make of those team talks, having watched them on the uh, the Amazon show. I'm certainly not sure what I'd made of the light bulb. But there's a really interesting psychology at work there. And they like the fact that he challenges him. There's no doubt about that. Or oh, challenges them, rather. They want him to be the Pied Piper leading them to the to the promised land. It's a it's a very interesting squad profile where you can probably get away with that for a certain amount of of players and for some players it's going to just be complete marmite and mm. uh, maybe he's got rid of all of those from the dressing room and the ones who are there now are definitely his players and so he can he can take them there. Um, Jack Grealish had a, a big response to a lot of the criticism that had been in the, in the previous week about not scoring and not creating. I mean, again, you know, one goal doesn't change everything, but it can help kick things on. Yeah, I mean, look, he looked a, a much more bouncy figure, didn't he, after the match um, than he had done in the last couple. I don't think he's been playing particularly badly, but again, it's it's exactly the same conversation. It's confidence. Uh, players, you know, attacking players want to be contributing, want to be scoring, want to be creating, to feel valued and worthwhile, feel they're justifying their place, particularly if you've got a £100 million transfer fee um, on your back, which Grealish has, and you know it's he's into his second season at City, and despite winning the league with them, if he was brutally honest, he'd probably give himself four or five out of ten, and he knows he's, he's he's capable of eight or nine out of ten. Well, you know that has an impact. That's 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 a season of not quite doing what you want to do. But England need him to be um, exciting and and pop pop positive and with the right mindset, and, and so does City. And City have got other options, more than England had. Uh, but we are now, what, eight weeks out from a World Cup. Um, great for Southgate for him to come into this squad this week looking like Jack Grealish again, even if he's only ever going to be a 20-minute man or a half-hour man for England. That's his role, I think. I don't think he's a starter. He's a late-impact substitute for England. Um, you know, in, in, sorry, Jerry. In all your years of following football and on the beast... Have you ever seen anything like Haaland? Apart from his dad, obviously, and that's probably just looks. He is a truly remarkable goal scorer. Um, because that's all he does. He really doesn't get involved in very much in, in set-up play. He's only interested, really, is in the 30 yards. He, he was his goal first area, goal. In the, in the six yards from goal area. His first goal outside the box, I think, since August of last year. Oh, I can believe it. I mean, but what he does do is he's so powerful. He's so strong. He's so clever. Uh, and he's so athletic. He doesn't look as if... He, the goal he scored uh, in midweek, you wouldn't imagine a bloke of that size could do that. You know, it was... He, he showed great agility. And he'll score all sorts of... He'll do whatever it takes to score. And he's just terrific. He, you know, he is... At the moment, the question is whether he's got 50 or 60 this season, isn't it? I mean, he just doesn't seem to want to stop. Yeah, Dick, I don't Dixie know. Dean if, is... Dixie, a, is I, I don't know. Like, if, if he stays fit and, you know, the, you know you're, you're hoping so. There was something about the little clip of him handing over the jersey to uh, the guy who's... Before the game, all the players are doing the warm-up. I don't know if you saw this, Martin. There was just something about it. Um, all the players just sort of tossed the jersey. Oh, and he placed it in his hands, yeah. He, he, he just went... Over and I mean... Life is so screwed up now with everything. You don't know is this actually? Maybe he knew the cameras were on him. I don't think he did. I think it was just he just seems a quite a quite a perfect guy in some respects, and he has a little bit of humility to go with it, despite the fact that he could be the best player ever. And look, he seems to have been brought up the right way by his by his father uh, and his, his his family. He seems to be he's been nurtured by the right sort of clubs. You know, he's played in small club in Norway, mm. and then he's gone to gone to Austria. And then he's gone to Dortmund and now he's gone to City. And obviously the next move will be Real Madrid or Barcelona, uh, which is the reason he won't break Premier League goal scoring records, Holland, because he won't be here long enough. He'll be off in big two call. or three years. Definitely, definitely uh, not. But, he, but in that period he's here, he'll have the greatest goal scoring rate of any striker, I would think. I can't Absolutely. see anyone get. Uh, he's going to average better than a goal a game the way things are going. Oh, yeah. um, speaking of the, the cameras, what have you made about um, David Beckham? and the queue because there's, there's definitely a viewpoint out there that he's about to face a tricky period of deep-seated links with Qatar for the money that he's taken to be an ambassador for this World Cup and now all of a sudden all anybody's talking about is um, he's uh, he's one of us Look, I think it's genuine uh, I think also the criticism or the, the, the scrutiny over his links with Qatar is 
genuine and, and right. The, the two things are divorced and distant, I think. This was him in a personal capacity doing something that he thought was right. And I know from previous conversations, he's a he's a big royalist uh, and a monarchist. And therefore, having met various members, probably all the members of the royal family at some point, he felt it was the right thing to do. I don't think one should ever criticise someone for, for their acts when they're acts of, of personal feeling and depth, which, which this one was. You don't queue up for 13 hours for a photo op. No. You know, you, you you might queue up for an hour for a photo op. You don't queue up for 13 I hours. I tend to agree. Op. I was I was at a gig recently and you had to queue an hour and a half for a beer and then I went to a festival the next day and it was like an hour queue for a lobster and I was like not no chance I'm not doing this again certainly not for thirteen even <laughs> you know I just I don't know, thirteen hours for lobster I'd probably take to be fair but and, uh, yeah it's, but how long is a long queue thirteen hours I mean it's pretty long that's long I've got a better question then for you who's England starting back for at the moment um, who are the centre backs I don't recognise a good starting <laughs> centre back partnership at the moment. No, not a Southgate. That's why he brought Eric Dyer back. Uh, I suspect at the moment he might be tempted to stick with the three and go Walker, Dyer, Stones, actually. Um, or he plays Walker at right back. Um, but if you see, I, I, if you go with the three, then you can play James and Chilwell as your two wing backs. And I think that's probably decent. The other option would be to play Saka at left wing back, actually, because he's just so versatile. He can play left back or right wing. He's a fantastic young player. Um, if you go with a four, I suspect it's Stones and Dyer. Right. Well, we've got plenty we'll of time see. to... We'll see on, on Friday and, and Monday, won't we've we? We've got better centre-backs than you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure we do at the moment just yet, but uh, we're getting there. Uh, Nathan Collins obviously had a, a weekend to be remembered. Great to have you with us, Martin. Thanks a million. Cheers. No worries. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, Martin Nathan Collins and Nathan Collins in some respects. Hey. It was pretty, um, we, we, he'll get over it. He'll get over it. As Grealish will get over it. Grealish will get over it, yeah. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you today. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll meets Ethan Asewa as OTB Gold at 1 o'clock. Splunk is live from 3. Culture Hall of Fame is Gavin James. OTB Gold is Michael Owen talking about his life after football. And then the show is live tonight with Joe in the hot seat. You can follow OTB across our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for the best in the latest sports content. We're back after these with Alan Quinlan after the opening weekend of the URC. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Newspapers have called it the greatest club game ever. Munster legends Alan Quillen and Neil Briggs are joining forces to bring you all the latest analysis, news, interviews and so much more. The strength of Munster rugby has always been the big boys up front. There's a lot of pressure on these guys continuously. I'm actually really, really excited for it. The Red 78 with Alan Quillen and Neil Briggs. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. If your business relies on a van, that wouldn't sound good. But this does. Get up to 75% off van insurance. Now available in FPD branches nationwide. FPD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. 75% no claims discount based on five years claims free. Available on new van policies used for farm or business purposes. Terms and conditions apply. Underwritten by FPD Insurance PLC. FPD Insurance Group Limited trading as FPD Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Celebrate European Week of Sport this September at the Be Active Festival. An action-packed day out for the whole family at Sport Ireland Campus Blanchardstown. Come and try new sports, fitness challenges and skill tests at Ireland's biggest sporting festival. Meet Sporting Legends. Check out the Inflatable Zone, Village Food Market and much more. There's something for everyone at the Be Active Festival. Saturday, September 24th at Sport Island Campus, Blanchardstown. Book your tickets now at beactivefestival.ie. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, 17 minutes past nine this morning. Alan Quillen is with us. Alan, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. Yeah, good. A bit of a whimper as opposed to a bang start for the URC. Um, but at the same time, plenty of lessons for us to learn and plenty for us to get stuck into. Um, let's start with Ulster Connacht. I think we probably expect Ulster to be better than Connacht this year. And the difference between the relative strength and depth of the two squads was clear. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it was um, in, in all the games, Ger- it was a bit rusty, um, which is understandable. I think there were a lot of them were disrupted with with preseason and players away and all that kind of stuff, which teams right across the board, even 
the Welsh and Scottish teams didn't have you know they lost pre-season friendlies last week um, with the Queen's passing and stuff like that so everyone was kind of disrupted so um, you're going to see some mistakes and errors but I think I was a little bit concerned I would be a little bit concerned for Connacht that uh, physically um, they got out muscled and dominated particularly up front um, and with all due respect to Ulster um, I know they're building something and Dan McFarlane has made them harder and abrasive and they're a very good side on their day um, that would be concerning that you'd be you know dominated I think their discipline was really poor Andy Friend spoke about it afterwards and and that's under pressure and it wasn't I know Connacht are missing some players as well but I just looked at the back five in Thornby, Fafita, Paul Boyle, um, Connor Oliver, Josh Murphy. That's not a bad kind of loose five, second row, back row. And, you know, the game was very kind of even up to probably 30, 30 minutes. And then McCluskey comes up with that brilliant offload for Luke Marshall's try. And then um, the game kind of changed the momentum. They scored another try and, and you just felt at half time that even though it was only 14-3 14, 14, that Connacht needed to come out of the blocks in the second half and, and show a bit of aggression and energy and they were just lacking a little bit. It's worrying but not concerning. It, it's worrying because it's kind of similar to the pattern that we saw last season in that um, they can't withstand a lot of pressure that eventually the defence breaks. Yeah, I think so. And look, to be fair, Ulster will probably do that to a lot of teams this year when they get on, on, on a roll and I think... Um, they're a very balanced side and, and their attack is really good and, and they can hurt you. But I think four of the tries probably came from malls. You know, they didn't score the four of them from the malls, but just a little bit soft um, in, in in their defensive efforts there in the forwards. And I think for Connacht, when they come under a bit of pressure then, and that's what Andy Friend was talking about openly after the game, you know, they, they give, they're they giving away penalties and they're, they're kind of crumbling a little bit. You've got to be patient. But look, it's very early days and... Um, it's 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 a tough place to go, but to be beaten thirty six ten, Caelan Blade scores a brilliant try in seventy minutes or something like that, and it's it's really only a consolation. But the game just completely got away from them in the second half, and it was Ulster on the front foot all the time. Where, where are Ulster in the hierarchy of the four problems now? They're they're probably number two, mm. um, given that the Johnny they beat Munster in that quarter final last year up in Belfast, and uh, convincingly in the end, uh, Munster had, you know probably brought one of their worst performances of the season to a quarter final and Ulster, you know, have kind of stepped up a little bit. They should have beaten the Stormers probably in that semi final in the URC. So easily could have been in the final. Um when when Ulster are good, they seem to be very hard to stop their flow, momentum, they play with pace, tempo. They've a lot of kind of X Factor players who can just do special things, you know. I know James Hume wasn't there the other night, but I love him in the centre. I think McCluskey has been brilliant for them. Um, they seem to know how they want to play and uh, are pretty, really, really well organised. But, you know, obviously they came up against Toulouse last year and, and were underpowered a little bit, which is... So, uh, Ulster in Europe is is hard to see and winning the European Cup. But I think they'll be right in the mix in the URC and, and at the moment they're probably number two. Uh, how good is Nathan Doak? Um, I've always been impressed with him. I think um, he's matured. He's still so young. Um, control and they're very lucky because John Cooney brings a different type of energy as well. You know, they've two brilliant scrum halves there. And um, I, I think Nathan Doe could be someone right in the mix next year for, for the World Cup. And even November, we'll probably see him. Um, we we'll see, could see him in the A game or even against Fiji. Um, you know, I think he's he's always been touted as a, a top class player and and he, now he, is the time to get I mean he's still very young so you don't want to rush him and you don't want to invest too much hope at, still I think 21 um, around that at, and like well he's playing enough of big games Jared, now to be physically kind of used to the contact the collisions I think he's mature uh, calm and controlled so you know he can only get better but I think he's 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 right up there now to put pressure on the the Irish scrum halves that are ahead of him um, the Connacht obviously are off to South Africa. A nice, handy, it's tricky, yeah. handy it's start. Tricky like. from they got the Stormers and the Bulls in the next couple of weeks. But you know they are a side that that when they play and hold on to the ball, and it sounds very obvious when they eliminate mistakes and and 
they're a very dangerous side, Connacht, and they can score a lot of brilliant tries. And we've said that about them for the last number of years. It's just in these... They should have made that more of a dogfight the other night. They made it too easy at times for Ulster to score the tries. Um, and, you know, they can go to South Africa and, and, you know, they'll throw the ball around and they can be brilliant at that. But they've got to do the fundamentals well, scrum, line-out, breakdown things like that and, and be more cohesive as a unit um, a lot of very very good individual players but I still think they're underpowered a little bit and they're similar to Munster in a sense that you know they were in the market for front row players as well but they're very hard to come by a year out from the World Cup as well and not just from a budget point of view but from quality being available and uh, they have some young players coming through there that again like Munster they want them to stand up and, and, and hopefully come through but it's difficult when you look at the depth of of um, you know that Ulster, that Leinster front row and stuff. It's it's a great scenario for Leo Cullen to have that kind of quality, and it does make a difference in these kind type of games. Yeah, um, Connacht obviously have several players away with the emerging Ireland. I think it's five in the squad, or maybe it's six. It's five, yeah. Five, yeah. So uh, obviously they'll be in South Africa at the same time as the um, as as Connacht playing those games too. So it's going to be tricky for Connacht. For this period of time, you just have to hope that they can. Yeah, and then they've got they've got Stormers, um, Bulls, two games there. You know, it's it's tough for any of the teams going to South Africa now. Um, the South Africans coming into the URC have have you know particularly winning it last year with the Stormers and 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 an all South African final. Um, it, they're going to get better. They're going to get more confident. And yeah. I think it's good for the league and it's good for the Irish provinces to, to keep testing themselves physically against them. So it's a tough couple of weeks. If they got a win there, one win, um, it'd be great. Uh, but it's a tough... Look, and Dan McFarland, I was reading quotes on him. It, every team seems to have a difficult run at the start. Um, I remember Munster last year, two home games against the South African teams who were completely disjointed and just trying to get together. Uh, but this is difficult for them and then they've got Munster at home in that, that fourth one which I'm sure they'll be targeting and they always get up for that and, and Munster Connacht games in the last number of years there's been a nice bit of bite to them but you think it's a very tough start for them and it's the last thing they need Ger, because they need to try and get a little bit of momentum I think they'd have been very disappointed last year to, to kind of slip down a little bit and not make the playoffs not make Europe um, because I think they, they were building something really nice for a couple of years there and yeah. it, it's just stuttered a little bit hasn't it yeah and we, we, we hope hope that will re-emerge that and it's difficult from budget wise they oh, don't course. have the same type of finances oh. and, and it's difficult to, to get players the um, the Emerging Ireland game is 10 days away or 11 days away at this stage the first one's the Friday um, afternoon and then it's Friday, Wednesday, Sunday so which is more important at the moment for Irish rugby the next three weeks of URC or that Emerging Ireland three games I was speaking about this with Adrian on Friday. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think the international team always takes preference for me. It has to, and that's even if I was a player, it it can be frustrating. Um, if you're a, a provincial player and you're losing players to emerging Ireland tours, Ireland A's, internationals, or they're not played in the derby matches at Christmas, um, I think it's the most important thing. And we we spoke at length the last time didn't we after the World Cup when we came back about how can we find something that's different that we can at least kind of throw our hat and say well we tried something different and I think the credit to the Irish team they've tried the, the Irish management they've tried to do that we were speaking about you know picking players who were playing for overseas clubs and seeing what they could they bring back and, and kind of closing off that or opening up that loophole and saying well we can select guys from abroad I, I, I think this tour is is even though when you go through the list, there's probably four or five that you would think could actually now go into an Irish team in November, there's probably another three or four could put their hands up for a World Cup. So it's kind of, if you get five, four or five players out of this in the next year, I think it's been a success. So I think it, it's, even though it's probably frustrating for, for the provincial coaches, and it's you can think Andy Friend is trying to pick his team Peter Wilkins up this week and you know have everyone available try and get their their internationals back as well and, and you think you're going off to South Africa and you're you're losing a couple of more players Munster's team next week will be totally different 10 of the players they've 10 going haven't they is it 10 or 11 they've 10 
all those ten were involved in the match against Cardiff at the weekend, and yeah. all that ten are gone now. Yeah. So I suppose you've got to get the got to get the good of having them on your squad. So you're definitely playing yeah. them if they're not going to be around. Uh, it's it's tough. It is tough. Um, I I do want to ask you about um, uh, kind of in that context the the Leinster Zebra game. It was interesting that they didn't start with Frawley from the start. That you know that the well he was in New Zealand, so I think there might there must be some sort of a. Some something different here because I think the, the the plan was that you know within reason, obviously the guys who started the tests in in, in New Zealand wouldn't be involved till round three. That's that's kind of was the plan. Okay. So you know, Kieran Frawley didn't start the test matches, so you know maybe there's a different reason. It counts the same, does it? It's yeah. I mean, it's very it's it's never made public. This player will yeah, play this number. Yeah, of yeah. Of so minutes. it's an individual thing. So I'm not privy to what what that was, but I would imagine it's because he hasn't. He didn't start because when they came back from New Zealand, they would have had an extra couple of weeks off and obviously going on their holidays and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I was surprised to see him involved, but maybe there's a break factored in somewhere along the line for him in the next couple of weeks that, um, or maybe Leo Cullen asked, could we have them for the first couple of games? Yeah, uh, what, does, sure. what does Leo Cullen say to them after that after that match where it's like this could have been one of the greatest collapses ever? Like, or was um, it was it something that they kind of were vaguely in control of what they were? You know, we're still going to win this. You think, Johnny, at 28, I think it was, was it's 21 nil after 26 minutes, you're thinking this is going to be 50, 60 pointer here. Um, and like from a neutral's point of view, you're thinking, God, it's brilliant that yeah. Zebra came back and they're making a fist of this and they're actually playing brilliant rugby. Um, like the offloads they had in the game, the, the line breaks were all superior to Leinster. Leinster were very efficient and direct early on and... Um, I think after the game you're kind of going first and foremost you're kind of wiping the brow saying thanks be to God we could have lost that I mean if you look at the last couple of minutes of that, that game it was you know it was 33-29 and they have brilliant opportunities they're holding on to the ball eventually they drop it mm. and there's a, an area of relief I think the changes that kind of came in Leinster were right down the depth chart there and you know they just needed a little bit more control and composure and um and they didn't have that, so you can take you can look at it from two ways. It's a great learning experience, and you still got the bonus point win. They shot twenty nine points, like yeah, they did. And and you know, given the, the score line the way it was, um, they lost the second half nineteen five. Mm. Does that make any difference? Not really. And you know, the points, the bonus point was coming home for Leinster, but um, a little concerning again. But it's it's hard to be critical on any of the teams mm. at this stage of the season because. There's going to be a bit of rust. They obviously switched off a little bit. Leinster standards have been so high, and and they've always had this kind of ruthless word connected with them, even with their their you know with their internationals gone. So I think that's kind of a, a kind of a pivotal moment. But if you think back to the last year, they lost the game early on. I think it was first or second game away to Dragons mm-hmm. over in in Rodney Parade in Wales, and um, or they barely won the game, I think. They barely won at 7-6 or something like that. And there was a lot of criticism there. That um, So they turned around their season and went on a, a, they a pretty strong idea. run. So I wouldn't be too concerned mm-hmm. with the depth they have. But it was brilliant to see Zebra kind of you know show their quality. And I think they, the name now as well. And they're trying to kind yeah, of... Yeah, but I think they'll score a lot of tries yeah. this year. They've like 20-odd attacking. new players. Yeah, they have. Yeah, it's, and... They've some brilliant attacking players. Their back three were outstanding, and um, so yeah, it was a game day. I think that he would have been reading the right act him if they lost it in the end. But it was, it was, it was, it wasn't a case of they were comfortable. The last kind of seven or eight minutes, um, they were kind of defending very strongly, but Zebra kind of lost control of the ball and stuff. But. Um, yeah, they'd be happy, obviously, in the end. But let's move on to to Munster then. Um, they're beaten twenty thirteen in Cardiff on Saturday afternoon. Game moved from the the Friday. Um, you were talking about rustiness, and they were super rusty. Like Malachi Fekatod, I think, knocks on his first ball, which you know, and then he gets into the game. So this is we're not we're not making any um, rash judgments on it. What will the team have learned from the performance? What what will they be? Thinking, okay, well, that didn't work. This needs to improve. Is it? Is this? Was that essentially the start of like a preseason friendly still because they haven't played enough games together? Yeah, and I think it, what 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 kind of stood out for me was that, um, and I think Graham Rowntree had to do this, even though 
because of all the changes he has in the next couple of weeks and I think because of the Emerging Ireland Tour things could have been a little bit different in pre-season where they actually said well, let's try and get as many of these players who are going to start the first URC game playing against Gloucester and London Irish but because after they play Cardiff there's going to be 15, there's probably 13, 14 changes next week to, yeah. to their game um, against Dragons that he had to mix and match those pre-season friendlies so they haven't got a kind of a clear and sometimes it needs a couple of games there was some positives in the game definitely um, what they were trying to do you could see from the attack um, I think what they lacked a little bit was control themselves and just sometimes making a decision to say you know what it's a little bit risky here trying to move the ball and, and someone calls a play and they're trying to get a bit of wit in it um, and maybe it's time just to put the ball down or find a way to, to, to kind of get some territory and I think right at the end Cardiff were just kind of inviting him onto him believing that they'd stopped them and they'd turned them over at the breakdown and uh, they got the score right at the end you know I think if you look at Munster getting a losing bonus point there was it's not a bad result given that the starting team had 13 Welsh internationals and it say, should have been 14 Owen Lane pulled out before the game in the warm up and Alan Summerhill came in he's a really good player so when I was doing my research for this game is it um, the strongest Cardiff team in a long time? it is yeah and Di Young has said that himself I think obviously Liam Williams went off and it was very unfortunate for him he's he's a top bloke but they brought on and, Reece Priestland uh, like it's you know yeah so they have you know it's 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 a strong side and a lot of these guys played against South Africa in 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 the summer so you can kind of look at it both ways i think Munster would have been frustrated when they look back at the video they'll be quite frustrated as a lot of the time they got caught kind of behind the gain line with an impact tackle and three or four Munster players ahead of that player so to to retreat and get back around and resource the ball was difficult. Cardiff were really counter-rucking very aggressively. So they got turned over a lot at the breakdown. Very concerning, I think. The the knock-ons and the drop balls were starting to become a little bit alarming, uh, you know, as the game went on. And, and I don't know, is it just guys switching off or just being a little bit rusty? But I thought, you, you know... Fekitoa started, you know, he's running that hard line off a line out and he knocks it on, hits him into the middle of the chest. Chris Farrell dropped a couple, Alex Candelan, um, Paddy Patterson was, was superb with his delivery and his sniping. Probably just got a bit excited and put two grubbers in it at times when he was making great breaks, but I think he was absolutely brilliant in the game. Um, fell off a couple of tackles and if you look at the three tries they conceded, well, they'll be frustrated with that, I think really frustrated so you can look at it both ways certainly from their own viewpoint when they when they analyse the video and if you're being harsh analysing what they could do better um, the breakdown and the, the ball the, that ball handling needs to be a lot better OK uh, all fixable like well I would think so yeah but that comes with a bit of cohesion as well Ger so um, you know I think it's very early days. I think um, sometimes it's down to personnel as well and what, what they can and can't do. But, you know, Chris Farrell looked very frustrated coming off. Um, he's a much better player than probably what we what we saw early on. Fekito, the same, looked frustrated. Um, he had they, had they all had glimpses in the game. Um, What's the story of Frisch? Um, people saying that he's, like, he's, I, I, you know, potential bolter for Ireland sooner rather than later that's I mean everybody who comes in who we've never seen playing in an Irish context all of a yeah. sudden is like the the next bolter but what what is like what's a what's his ceiling I think they're very 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 enthused by him um, his potential um, obviously he's still a very young player and hasn't been exposed to, to top level rugby consistently I think he he they were impressed with him in Bristol as well and what his potential is. He's still only twenty three, so um, what I'm hearing is that they really like him and he has serious potential. And I think that's why he's going on that emerging tour to South Africa. He is someone who could come in the uh, come right into the mix. Obviously, we've got to see it ourselves, and he's got to do it. You can be enthused and excited about certain players, but they've got to show it then when they go out in the field and play. But I think he's someone definitely that 
they're really, really happy with and, and uh, they're hopeful that he can make a real impact there. OK. Um, is there any word on the long-term injuries around uh, Munster, Archie Snyman in particular? It's kind of gone yeah, very I quiet. I think he's pretty close. I is think, he? yeah, yeah, he is. Um, I think they've been obviously trying to get this right um, and make sure that like any knee injury, I think there was a small little, you know, soreness there and, and a cartilage issue over the summer, which is fine now. Um, and I think, look, he he's someone that obviously they've, you know, he's a game changer if he's playing for him. And yeah. everybody, I think, uh, wants to see him back and playing. So I think he's pretty close. Um, it'll, it'll, whether it'll be, whether it'll be in the, this block of, of matches, I'm not sure, but... Um, I'd rather hold him back for another couple of weeks and have him, you know, for for Europe and and post Christmas and stuff like that. But I, I'm sure he wants to get back playing himself. And when he's ready, he'll be ready. But I think he's pretty close. The last thing we were talking about um, in the build up to the whole season was the front row and and the need for players to step forward. Obviously, we're not going to make a judgment yeah. after one game. But was there anything encouraging? Well, I tell you that that's what I was going to talk about. Uh, Keenan Knox and Roman Salanoa again, early days. But they're up against internationals there, you know, and Reese Carey, um, he's a very strong scrummager. I think um I think both of them played really well. Okay. I think they were just and I looked at the scrum each time they were rock solid and they were getting a little nudge at times, and that's the stuff that I want to see before the stuff around the field, because that's where they're gonna be judged. And I think both of them played you, you can know, layer on the stuff around the field. Yeah, well, let's see. Um, you know, both of them are... Well, Ken, Kenny Knox was making carries, uh, trying to poach ball, making impact tackles. When Roman Salanoa came on, he was the same. I think he hit uh, Talupi Falato at one stage and smashed him backwards. And I think he did that on a couple of occasions with Cardiff players running hard. And, and he has that kind of strength and power. Yeah, so as much as, as RG Snyman's going to be a game changer, having those uh, having two... Having them getting better, yeah, for yeah. sure. And they've got to... Stephen Archer is, was, has had an injury for the last few weeks. And, you know, the next tight is James French. So that's an area that there is concern. And if those players step up and at least get their set-piece stuff right... Yeah i.e. solid, rock-solid scrum, well, that'll be a massive plus for Munster. OK. Anything else from the weekend? Well, the, the rugby championship's still alive, I think, obviously, when, when South Africa, South Africa-Argentina, that was incredible, a game the other night with Argentina, a pretty dominant 22-6, or South Africa, pretty dominant 22-6 up, and then Argentina come right back, and uh, and then they change gears and just won it in the end. So, um they're all level at the top New Zealand, South Africa and uh, New Zealand game don't. insane as well like just like right at the end insane yeah. on Thursday morning it was <laughs> just uh, incredible Australia have written to the World Referees Board saying come on well, well, come on come on this needs to be fixed um, I, and I think obviously technically you know uh, Matthew Renal was right um, there's footage there that you can clearly hear him saying it ma- numerous times but we haven't seen it before you know, we haven't seen no, it. No, it's like the um, it's like the free in GA when the goalkeeper comes out of the the small parallelogram. It's actually supposed to be at one stage it was a it was a free if if a seventy sixty five to the opposition and you're like oh that seems and then it happened once I think in like a, an underage final and was like no this you can't can't be doing this but uh, maybe you can big big call and, if and maybe you just do it now from now TV, on you know you'd be thinking we'd be given out as well yeah. so um, all right. Yeah, look, if they're going to do it now, he, they probably have to do it throughout yeah, back, the game. Back you know, if you go on, I just, I'll finish with this. If you go on to YouTube and you watch a game, the highlights of a game, or or even put on a full game on YouTube, and you and you say, right, the ball has kicked the touch, and you go for a line-out, and you press forward, forward, forward to get to the line-out, you can probably do that three or four times, and they're 15-second blocks before the line-out is even set. So there's definitely issues in rugby. And it's the same with a scrum, Johnny. If there's a knock-on, you can hit it forward three times, I'd say, before that scrum is actually set. So we have a lot of dawdling and foostering and delaying yeah, yeah. Throughout, yeah. throughout the game. Yeah, they'll change that, the game if they, if that they it, fix that. Yeah. All right, Alan, good stuff. Thanks a million. OTB AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're back tomorrow with Shane Hannan in studio, live with Gareth A. Davis on the prospect of Tyson Fury fighting Anthony Joshua in December. Uh, retired Leinster Centre Conor O'Brien will reflect on his rugby career cut short and much more besides right now we're going to leave you with a classic crappy quiz see you tomorrow OTB AM with Gillette 
Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar.